CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Welcome. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Tuesday, March 26th, 2024. I am Select Board Chair Eric Helmuth. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with provisions in state law for remote participation in public meetings. I will now confirm that all members and staff are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Affirmative. John Hurd? Yes. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Len Diggins? Here. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Town Manager Jim Feeney? Yes. Town Council Mike Cunningham? Yes. Select Board Administrator Ashley Marr? Yes. And I'll note that tonight our colleague Mr. Diggins is remote. Mr. Diggins, can you hear all the members and staff? I sure can, loudly and clearly. Excellent. Before we, get, we begin, please note the following. This meeting is being conducted in the select board chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcasted on ACMI. People wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. People participating either in person or by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name and place of residence in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the town's website, specifically the select board agendas and minutes page. If technical difficulties sever the remote connection to one or more participants and efforts to reconnect within a reasonable period of time are unsuccessful, the in-person meeting will continue at the discretion of the chair, provided that a quorum of the board is physically present. Zoom participants are encouraged to retain the phone number provided in their confirmation email for a backup audio connection to the meeting. Tonight there will be a number of opportunities for public comment. I will announce those as they come up. If you are attending by Zoom and want to participate, please raise your hand in Zoom when I announce that the public comment is open. If you're in the room, of course, you can raise your hand in real life. If you do not know how to raise your hand in Zoom, now would be an excellent time to Google for how to do so. And finally, because one or more select board members are participating remotely, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call, and I will ask our trustee town council to remind me of that fact should I fail to remember. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Our first item of business is our uh, much anticipated annual presentation of the Community Preservation Act Committee's recommended projects. There are three of us here tonight. Christine, you can sit over here. <laughs> Sue Doctorow <Hi>. and <clears throat> Dave and, Swanson. And, oh, and, and, and you introduce yourself as well, oh, I, because uh, I did name, not introduce you. <laughs> my name is Clarissa Rowe. I'm the chair. Um, Sue Doctorow is here as the vice chair. Dave Swanson is at home with a sick child. We wish him the best. Yes. Um, and. This, and Alexander does a wonderful job making a great presentation even better. Um, the other members of the committee are Leslie Mayer, um, Ken Lau, Joanne Robinson, Joanne Preston, and Brian McBride. Now, I'm sure you've already read all of this, um, and you know CPA. So I'm gonna go through it really quickly, and then what I'll do is stop after each um, area, and I don't have to go through this either, um, and see if you have any questions on those particular ones. We'll start with the housing, please. This is a very interesting project um, that the Housing Authority is starting to do, and it'll be an independent um, building, and we're giving them $200,000. Um, then we have Sunnyside. Um, we're giving them another 500000 um, for the construction phase of the work. And this is a very exciting project in East Arlington. Um, next, we have the, their homeless uh, prevention program, which is new and wonderful to be starting. Um, and that's 50000 And then we have the Greater Somerville um, Homeless Coalition for 
their thing of 1680, 800. And the reason they do that is they're putting the difference in rents. Um, so if there's a very, very expensive rental property, they, um, they pay the difference and they pay it directly to the landlords. So it's a very good uh, use of the money and it's not very much money. And then the last one is a new roof for the Shea House, which is owned by the Cambridge um, Salvation Army, but is on Wellington Street. It's a beautiful old building. And that's it for housing. Any questions? Any questions on the housing? Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Not a question, but a, a thank you comment that, um, as you know, Mr. Hurt and I sit on the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, another. Um, and we see projects, especially the Housing Corps of Arlington uh, project, um, and our meet, money got cut basically close to in half. Mm. And there were things we couldn't fund, and I'm so grateful, especially with that program and others, that yeah. you're able to uh, give them the funding, because it really hurts, you know, to say no to anybody. But it was well, a they, new program, yeah. and we had to cut back on everybody else, so I do appreciate. Yeah, thank you. No, it's... Um, you know, housing is a very important issue everywhere, but it's, it's also very important here. And the housing authority has done, I mean, the housing corporation has built so much good housing in this um, town that it's important to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a question about the about the uh, new grantee this year. Um, I'm thrilled to see the return of the Somerville Homeless Coalition. I think that is such short money for a big return, and and the HCA's Homelessness Prevention Program is also a really good investment yep. to just keep people in housing. Uh, but I wonder if you could tell us a, a little bit about um, the residents or the programming at Shea House. Yes, it's um, first of all the neighbors think it's fine. Um, this was brought to me by a man named John Marr. We've heard of him. <laughs> Who thought it would be an excellent um, candidate. And it's um, a program for people with substance abuse, problems that are past, and they're getting a lot of really wonderful um, help. Mm -hmm. And anything else you think I should say? Yeah. So? It, well, it's called a sober house, mm -hmm. and it's housing 10 to 15 men, and they graduated from. Um, drug and alcohol rehab programs or men's shelter program of the Salvation Army. Um, and they've transitioned from this. It prevents them from becoming homeless and get, lapsing back in. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. I mean, I had no idea the, yeah. about Shea House. It's really very yeah. important. We um, have a lot of residential um, houses in Arlington, which serve a real need. I had one in my old neighborhood, so I, I know about yeah. how important it is. Oh, I'm very glad to know about that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions about the housing before the move? Okay. Go ahead to your next category. Okay. Next Actually, question. Mr. Chair, quickly, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm I need sorry. to get my hand up. I'm sorry, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Chair, my, no please, problem. Yes. No problem. I, I get my hand up in time. You know, so no, I'm, I'm really happy to see all these um, programs on, on this row. Um, with respect to the um, Somerville Homeless Coalition, the, the 16-8K, how many, um, how many people does this help? Um, they have, um, it, let's see, they operate 25 apartments in Arlington, and that houses 40 people, and what they're asking from us will subsidize 14 of the apartments. Huh? Um, All right. And they've had some of these for as long, long as 15 years. Yeah. And as I, yeah. As and I said, I think the important thing for them is that they have a real good relationship with the landlords. So the landlords keep, if the people move, they keep allowing new people to come in. Great. And, All right. Thank you. And, and what we're giving them is leveraging, they said, $590,000 from HUD. <clears throat> well, that's a good detail. I'm glad I asked just yeah. for, for that. <laughs> so, you know, so. So, yeah. so great, excellent. So um, they're so. trying to make up the difference between what HUD will give and what the actual val market value is in Arlington. Gotcha. Yeah, no, no, that's a really uh, great detail. So uh, increases the value by a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Sure. I'll try to catch you next time. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look up and make sure you don't have your hand up. Again. 
um, historic preservation. This first one is, um, as you all may know, there are a lot of books in the cellar here, but, um, and they need to be preserved. You can see what kind of shape they're in and how when people ask for documents, it's important that they um, don't fall apart. So the idea is to start digitizing those marriage um, records. And it's a start. It's not going to do everything. But we have them from a very long time ago. And the next one is um, the wonderful garden. And to finish it off, we're going to finally um, spend $115,000. And that will <coughs> you know, do the planting from the original Olmsted Brothers plan that goes around that wonderful reflecting pond that now is the center of the garden and a great asset. And then we have Foot of the Rocks, um, which, as you know, is going to be a very important um, historic site in Arlington in the future. Um, one of the things that came up during the discussion about this is it's quite an expensive project, and um, I think it's over a million dollars to build it, and was a discussion of bonding. And when we started CPA, um, the finance committee didn't want us to bond, mm -hmm. so we never have. And we had a very good discussion, because the committee has to decide yes or no. And the committee decided this project wasn't uh, ready for that, but they did think that, um, you know, doing work on town hall, I don't know why. <laughs> um, and I believe the um, conference room is falling down, and you assume that cupola is going to be coming down. I think it's time we focused on that, and, um, you know, maybe Mugar one day, and Sue wants to buy a farm. I know. I, you know I, <laughs> well, I mean, I always think back to Lex Farm, and, you know, it's an opportunity that that town had that, you know, if that had passed by, it would have been a bunch of houses. So that, to me, is the type of situation where bonding is really powerful. And I, I mean, I would definitely favor it for those kinds of projects. Not that there's a farm waiting for us, but <laughs> anyway. Yes. Any questions? Any questions on the historic preservation projects? Okay. No. Okay. And on to open space. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the McLennan Detention Pond <laughs> Survey, and it's looking at why the detention pond isn't working as well. There will be a bathymetric survey, which means a survey of how deep the pond is and why it's all silting up. It's in conjunction with some other um, work that they're, they're doing um, near the detention pond, but it's, it's a wonderful project to make this important place better. Um, the open space, the public land management addendum is building on the work that was already done by CPA, and they didn't feel that they had done enough work um, on some of the other lands, and so they asked for some more. $25,000. And then the other one is the Minuteman redesign at Ryder Street and at Burns Arena. Um, it came in more money, but one of the problems of this area is the bike path is owned by the MBTA. And we tried at one point in the Heights to do a connection and it didn't work because of the MBTA. They have very strict insurance criteria and um, there's difficulty working with them. So we gave him 50,000 to start the process to look at it. It's also at an intersection of a street and the uh, bike path. I think it's a great idea, but I think that there's a lot of pre-work that needs to be done. And the Crosby Park Court and park renovation. This was the most controversial one we had mm. when we had our public meeting. Um, and 
Part of it was because the town had shown a bunch of pickleball courts and basketball courts, and the neighbors just went. <laughs> pickleball is not really that um, popular with neighbors. Um, everywhere I go, and I still do a lot of public work, people are always saying, oh, those pickleball courts, they're awful. So this is really the beginning of the park and recreation process where they're hire a landscape architect, they'll have public meetings, they'll find out what the people living in the neighborhood want, and I bet it's not gonna be pickleball. <laughs> well, I, and also they were concerned about loss of green space. There, yeah, were, there were people trees. speaking to that. So it's, you know, it's a conflict between paving and courts and mm -hmm. green space. And so yeah. we were hoping, first of all, we couldn't give them 1.5 million. And if they can have a design process for 10% of that, they can get a lot of public input. And yeah, then, which is what they need. Yeah. Um, and the last one is Monotomy Rocks Park play and picnic area for 400,000. I don't know why they took down that, that playground that I built. <laughs> it was only 30 years old. <laughs> no, it, was, it was really dangerous. And so I'm really glad that this is happening because I think it'll be a wonderful addition. It always was a great place. And the picnic area hasn't been well used and now it will be. So that's it. And then we have the last slide, unless you have any questions. Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, just a question on the Minuteman bikeway redesign and uh, a comment after the question, but I, I see the drawing there, like the initial design is that to um, maybe split each side of the bike path where it meets Ryder Street, and I'm just wondering where the arrows, if if there was discussion, if that's so preliminary. It's sort um, of preliminary. Okay. I, I think the idea was to have a stopping place for the bikes so they could, you know, bicycle to the games, um, bicycle to the rink, um, have a, you know, shady place to sit and take a, you know, take a stop. Okay, thank you. And, and just a comment, Mr. Chairman, I mean, here, this is another example of the difficulties working within the right of way with the MBTA, and it, it, it just is so frustrating because I know it's been frustrating for the committee, frustrating for the town, because there are a number of projects up and down the bike path where we hear it over and over again, this, this difficulty with the MBTA. There's a, there's a very worthwhile potential project down near Mill Street, the stairwell that mm -hmm. leads from the, the pathway to the bike path. It's in disrepair, it's been in disrepair for years, but what I'm told is because of the right-of-way issues, um, that has not been selected yet. And um, I, I'm gonna reiterate that, that the need for, for us maybe to do this regionally or um, try to do something on this because it just, it just seems like, I, I understand if you're introducing commerce to the like right. the insurance issues, but some of these things, it just doesn't make well, any sense uh, to me. You know, I, I, my current job is designing bike, a lot of bike paths for the gateway cities in, in Massachusetts. And we run across this all the time. We've actually developed, we, but my team has developed a very good working relationship with the real estate people from the MBTA. So I might give you some names of people to talk to. Thank you. Um, it's, you know, it's like beating your head against the wall. It's, it's not great. And there are so many, you know, so many good uses that could happen. Right? And the, the Downing Square project is a really good example because yeah. I live in that neighborhood and communal access to the bike path that everybody could use was, right. you know, was offered and the residents there, they can see the bike path from their window and they can't get there. Right. And it's so frustrating because yeah. it's the perfect kind of place to have that yeah, access. True. Thank you. Oh, he's got his Mr. hand Lance. up again. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Dr. I, mean, I, I uh, want to get back to you. I mean, there's certainly some interesting developments along those lines, but also um, uh, the town manager and I had a conversation with the executive director of the MBTA advisory board, and he's given us some other possibilities as to what can be done to help um, um, us and other municipalities get access I mean, to uh, bike paths I mean, in in their um, in their areas, I mean, and so um, we'll we'll pursue this um, with them. We, uh, we made a commitment to 
keeping continuing to work on this feed and and it'd be interesting to see uh, Ms. Rowe if the names he gives us with respect to the MBTA um, realty company is the same ones that you can give us so right, so I'll right, be back in touch with you work. about that too thank you that's great thank, thank you. you Lynn thank you Lynn um, and then the last slide is the money and we have our money person right here and Christine Bongiorno has who has been doing two jobs for CPA um, so far, and luckily Lauren is coming and leaving somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but we are so grateful. Christine, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah. I think you covered it. <laughs> <laughs> we're giving away less than we have, so yeah. that's as opposed to more. Well, we, we were um, conservative as we mm -hmm. needed to be. Ms. Mahan. I have on the last slide. Um, and, and I don't know if it's an answer that we can necessarily get tonight, but I know when the Community Preservation Act was first discussed in town, it was quite the discussion. Uh, and, and one of the discussions uh, revolved around that um, it looks good right now, but then as more communities get in, state's not going to match it anymore, mm -hmm. so on and so forth, along with other things. We won't talk about the bonding. Um, but I see pretty consistently the state seems to be matching us at 10%. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know, is that, um, obviously when my math is right, it is 10%. Is, is that something we can pretty much count on? Because I think all the communities that wanted to get, yeah. in, get in have gotten in, or do you see that it's, number, it's, that it's match going up or down? It's been higher than that for a very long time. And it's just this year with the state revenues going down. And I think that Jim and Christine were good about being conservative because, no, we didn't want to promise people money that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. And that's always been our motto, and I think it's important that we do that. So that's a conservative 10%, because yeah. Yeah. normally, I'm saying, how did it go from 20, 8, 18 to 20% to 10? Yeah. But we're conservatively estimating right. again. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, I just wanted, for the public's in, uh, information, uh, the. Uh, Community Preservation Act Committee does take these recommendations for funding directly to town meeting. Yes. Um, and, uh, but the, but the, I think the bylaw asks you to consult with the select board, which is what you're doing here, and thank you for that. Um, thank you for your excellent work. I love this lineup of projects. And uh, I know firsthand, and you know how I know, how much work it is to get there, <laughs> um, and how hard it is to, to have many more times the amount of need and request than you have to spend. So I think oh. you've chosen wisely. Thank you so much. And, if we could ask you for a vote of support. Absolutely. Um, have one from the Finance Committee. Endorse, you mean, maybe? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I would Move entertain endorse. such a motion. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Mr. Diggins, your hand is up. I just want to say, I think the presentation is really, really good. You know, uh, uh, Alexander uh, did a great job on it. It, uh, uh, it, it, it was just, a, it's just visual, visually very nice. So um, please pass along my appreciation to um, Mr. Francois, thank you. I will, certainly. Um, there was a template that was left behind by the last CPA. <laughs> but I, I don't know who that might be. <laughs> it, I will say it gets better and better every year. And, and Mr. Francois, <laughs> if, you are, if you are listening, the color coding uh, on, this, on this project area was a very nice touch. <laughs> yes. OK, we have a motion to, was it, was it to endorse mm -hmm. by Mrs. Mahana, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Thank you, sir. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank all. you all. Yep. This now brings us to the consent agenda. We have the minutes of meetings from February 21st and March 4th of this year. We have a request for a one day beer and wine license on April 20th at Robbins Town Hall for a private event by Rennie Zimmerman. We have the uh, annual Heights Spring Fling Festival, Saturday, May 18th, 2024, by Janet O'Reardon of the Heights Community Association. This is a recurring event that we've approved in the past. We have a request for a contactor and drain layer license by ACRA and Sons Incorporated from Woburn. Another request for a contractor drain layer license from North Heritage Construction Corporation, uh, Adriano Mendes from North, Kelmster, North Kelmsford. We also have reappointments to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Board, but I do have two corrections to this list uh, to suggest to the board to um, 
for, for the motion. So I would suggest for the motion, the consent agenda, that um, two of the appointees actually aren't voted on by this board. One of them is myself, Eric Helmuth. I am the board's designee, uh, which we can vote on at a, a different meeting when we notice that. So um, I would suggest striking that name. Um, and also Beth Elliott is the town manager's designee and is an ex officio non-voting member. So I would suggest striking that from the motion as well. Attorney Cunningham, is it acceptable to make those amendments without pulling this out of the, uh, the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair. So if anybody would like to make that motion or the motions with those provisions, uh, I would entertain that at this time. Any other discussion? Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move favorable action on the consent agenda with the two amendments on the reappointments, removing the chair, Mr. Helmuth, and, and uh, Ms. Elliott. Second. That sounds strange. I know. <laughs> oh, that's some town meeting language. That's right, yeah. Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda vote? Okay, I think we're ready for a, moment, a vote. Attorney Cunningham. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote on the consent agenda. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to item nine, which is discussion and approval fiscal year 2025 water and sewer rates. Mr. Feeney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to also welcome uh, Mike Rademacher, our Director of Public Works, this evening as well. Uh, Mike was kind enough to prepare uh, the memo that he does each year that was provided for in the board's packet uh, for tonight's meeting. <clears throat> uh, the memo is quite clear, but to summarize uh, what we're proposing, uh, as it is the time of year for the fiscal year 25 water and sewer rates, is a uh, in a modest increase of 3.05% for water rates and a rate increase of 3.13% for sewer. So uh, as noted in the memo, there are a few assumptions upon which those rates are based and you know the main driver of that of that is the amount of water that we will expect to be consumed in the community uh, for the given year. Of course, that is uh, an estimate, but it is an estimate that's based upon uh, historical consumption. Uh, so Director Rademacher and his team look back five years uh, and take both the highest and lowest years out of the equation as anomalies and then sort of average those the three middle years is what we would expect to be uh, our consumption for the leading year moving forward uh, so with that uh, rate increase uh, you know the average cost to an Arlington home household per three month bill for what would have been uh, in fiscal year 23 would have been $283 in fiscal year 24, $293. Uh, actually, Mike, is that second column supposed to read 24 and 25? Yes. I apologize. So for, for fiscal year 25, the average home bill would be $293. So uh, based on these rates, the expected increase for a three-month bill would be approximately $10 for the average Arlington household. Any for the comments from the director of public no, works? No. Mr. Feeney explained it very well. <laughs> Mr. Hurd. Move approval. And just note, I like this nice, concise. I don't know if every year is this concise, but it, it helps us kind of condense the, the info. And I can carry this around with me because every day somebody tells me that their water bill doubled. <laughs> I'm like, no, it didn't. Did not double. Um, so we can show them the modest increase in their water rate this year. So. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second the motion and uh, thank you, Mr. Rademacher, for the presentation. And, and this is the percent is going down from last year. And if we go back a couple of years, we were seeing double digit increases in the water and sewer rates because of the, the shift in the, in the debt. So that's good news. And um, I like to always have this conversion uh, just because I, I, we get asked an awful lot about water. And a CCF is 748 gallons. So the Average user at 60 CCF, you're using about 45,000 gallons of water. 
that's about two and a half cents per gallon by, by my math. So, um, and it, it, it's not doubling and it, it's um, for, for, the, for the amount of services and that, 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 that we're getting, we, we really appreciate it. And we're part of MWRA, so there's a lot of costs that we incur with that, but uh, appreciate all the work um, that you do and, and, and your team does because it's, it's, there are always challenges out there with water main breaks and fixing them and, and getting things repaired and, and minimizing the, the, the loss of water. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm only bringing this up because Mr. Hurd said that he's going to carry this around. You know, so, so I do think we're going to probably need to fix some year designations on this, right? Because as I think Mr. Feeney just pointed out, that um, that second column I mean, when we're comparing rates should be, well, actually, we should fix the first, both columns, right? It should be fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. That is correct, Mr. Yes. Diggins. Okay, and, and then above that, I mean, where we have the sewer, you know, we have fiscal year 24 existing, and then I think we'll want fiscal year 25 proposed, right? Correct. I apologize okay. for that. Right. I'll, I, can, I can resubmit that with the correction. No problem. I, I've just been a little traumatized, too, with fiscal years down designation, so that's why I'm a little paying attention to this a little more. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Just so we're clear, I'm not actually going to carry this. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what our laminated, laminated card budget would be for a... Uh, going to be my question at the debate. <laughs> That's right. You're going you're to take a picture and then you're going to show it to them on your phone, Mr. Bird. I know what you got. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Rademacher. I, I do appreciate this. And as the most recent winters go by, um, I worry a little bit about snow and if we're going to have enough people out there to plow the snow. But I worry more so, especially with the extreme temperatures, um, every time it's really, really cold out there or an ice storm, invariably there's at least one, if not more, huge um, uh, water burst, pipes burst, um, yes. that the, our D DPW crews have to be out there, and they have been out there. And Mr. Feeney, uh, at one of the meetings, noted a particularly rough stretch of uh, weather that we had, and there were at least two, if not three, really um, large pipe bursts that the crews had to respond to, um, which what they're paid is a whole discussion for another night, but, um, but the question that, so, so please pass along our thanks um, to the crew. Sometimes people might think, oh, well, there's no snow, so that, you know, they don't have to come out in it. Well, it's even worse now when those really cold freeze, freezing temperatures are out there. Um, and I've been allegedly down in a hole every now and then, and it's, <laughs> it's not fun, and, and I'm only there 10, 15 minutes. So. Um, but uh, in the past, when you've spoken about the uh, replacement project for the town and said we were doing about a mile a year, and you were hoping to increase on that, I'm just wondering, are we still at that one mile a year, or have you increased or hope to increase that? So we are still at about a mile a year, um, <coughs> although, so, and I hadn't accelerated that program during the time we were changing the rate structure with the shift. Uh, it would have been a lot to um, add to the rates, but I think now as the dust is settling a little bit from that, um, the, the shift of the funds from the tax base to all rates, um, and, and the rates are now a little bit more stable, I think we'll have the opportunity to look for some additional funding to increase the um, the water main replacement program. And I have a technical question that probably doesn't have an answer, but um, it, as you go forward and, you know, I'm thinking of um, just this past winter, thinking of at least three of the um, pipes that burst that were really big jobs. When you're going through the exercise of, you know, what that one mile and maybe some years, two mile uh, restoration project would, will be, is there a technology that like, like do you choose it just on a graph metrics system or I'm thinking of those particular ones that were really big um, is that something we can foresee um, you know in in the the warmer weather to know that's that's what's going to go in the one mile project or is it you just can't tell when one of those are going to go right it's tough to know uh, exactly when a, a, a pipe might fail um, we do keep records of failures and as a certain area shows more and more incidences we focus on those areas uh, we also focus on uh, older pipe that is um, could become more brittle or um, areas where maybe the construction wasn't as 
great when it was put in, so it's more susceptible to the fluctuations in temperature and the uh, um, soil that was used during construction. So we do take into a, a lot of in, into consideration, uh, but it is hard to predict when something like that would happen. We really we strive for the, the known, the guys who work are great, as you mentioned, and they know the system well, and, they, <laughs> and they're constantly talking to me, Mike, you gotta replace the pipe over here. So we have a pretty good handle on uh, the condition of the mains, and we, and we, we strive to um, replace them based on our experience and also the age. At the same time, we're also working with other utilities that are doing replacements and roads that we want to pave, so it's kind of a, a juggling act to get the best bang for our buck when we're looking at these projects. Well, thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion from the board? Okay, I think we're ready for a vote. We have a motion to approve by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Approved 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, this brings us to item 10, and this is the warrant article hearings. So tonight we'll be hearing articles 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 in that order. So the way we'll do the hearings is as follows. We'll first invite a proponent of, of the article uh, to come up and give a presentation. At that time, uh, I will invite the uh, town manager or board to make any, uh, ask any questions, make any preliminary comments. Then we'll open it up for a public hearing for public comment, both in Zoom and in the room. This is the part where you learned, you've learned to raise your hand in Zoom. Um, and at, after that point, after public comment is finished, and there'll be a three-minute time limit for public comment, not for, the pres uh, not for the first presentation, but for public comments. Um, after that point, then the board will resume its discussion and um, come to a consensus about motions. What we're doing here tonight for the sake of the public is uh, these are warrant articles before town meeting, and these are bylaw amendments, and um, for the most part, the uh, purpose of this is for, to, uh, for, the, for the select board to hear it, to give the public a chance to weigh in, and to make a recommendation to town meeting. But the final decision is town meetings because they are the elected rep legislative body of the town. So our role per the town's town manager act and our bylaws is to hear these and, and give an informed opinion to town meeting. So that's what we're doing tonight and with all our warrant articles. So with that, we'll start with article 15, bylaw amendment prohibition of fair trade restrictions on fur products. Ms. Dre, welcome. Good Please introduce yourself and where you live and tell us about this article. Fantastic. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Dre. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 10 and I'm on Jason Street in Arlington. Awesome. Um, I do have a slideshow. Excellent, <laughs> perfect, great, all right, thank you. So I'm really pleased to be in front of you this evening. Arlington has been a leader in passing local and state laws that support animal, environmental, and human health. And I'm here to ask the select board to continue this proud tradition by voting to prohibit the sale of new fur products in Arlington. Why this bylaw and why now? I think it's important uh, to understand the central role that Arlington plays in the current grassroots movement to protect animals and the environment. With your support, 2022 town meeting passed two groundbreaking bylaws to prohibit the use of some rodenticides to protect predators such as owls, eagles, and falcons. Recognizing the importance of those bylaws, other towns reached out to Arlington to see how they could do something similar in their towns. Many had already passed an anti-fur bylaw and asked Arlington to do the same. So in reciprocation, in solidarity, and because it's the right thing, Arlington agreed to try in here I am. This bylaw is a result of a coalition of Massachusetts town governments and local grassroots groups like Save Arlington's Wildlife, coming together to make real sustainable change at the local level because we simply cannot afford to wait for the state to act. All right, ready for slide two, great. So um, to begin, I just wanted to clarify what is actually gonna be prohibited and not prohibited by this um, bylaw. So finished fur products from animals raised in fur farms or trapped and killed only for their pelt, pelts and sold in person in retail stores in Arlington is what we're, I'm uh, asking to be prohibited. 
It does not prohibit the sale of leather, cowhide or sheepskin, used for sold privately or secondhand, for use for Native American tribal purposes, for religious purposes, and it will not affect hunting or taxidermy. Next slide, please. So after speaking to uh, folks in all the retail stores in Arlington that we thought might possibly sell fur, I'm pleased to say that we found zero. Nobody is selling uh, new fur products in Arlington. And in fact, most of them were incredulous that, that anyone actually is selling new fur products. Um, and they were supportive of this Warren article. Uh, Kaylee Yurenka is the owner of a local business, Yes, down in um, East Arlington. And she, uh, her full quote is here, but she supports this Warren article and says that she's proud to be part of a town that prioritizes humane treatment of animals and reducing the negative environmental impact we have in our community. There is one resale store in Arlington and they will not be affected by this bylaw. So there's times when doing the right thing can adversely affect existing businesses, but fortunately this is not one of them. Passing this bylaw will have no negative effect on any business that's open in Arlington today. So you may wonder what is the point of um, restricting the sale of fur in a town that doesn't sell fur? And so I would say that this is the best time to do it, right? It, we're not affecting any current businesses, we're being proactive and we're being preventative because you cannot stop this cruel industry if there's still a demand for the products. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Arlington has been a consistent um, supporter both locally and statewide. We have a voting record that demonstrates our commitment to animal welfare. So as you'll see on the slide, the majority of Arlington, Arlingtonians voted to support these animal welfare laws. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna read them to you, uh, but you have them in front of you. Um, Next slide, please. So the fur industry is extremely cruel to animals and it's completely unnecessary. The vast majority of fur sold in America comes from fur farms, where animals spend their entire lives in small crowded cages, often unable to move. And when it's time for them to be slaughtered, fur farmers will often use the least expensive way to kill them and still maintain the pelt. And that includes electrocution, gas, poison, suffocation, and even live skinning. And in 2024, I just feel that there's just simply no justification to allow animals to be killed like this simply for their fur. Next slide. And it's not only wildlife that's affected by these traps. It's also affecting you know, our family dogs and cats. Pets across the country, including right here in Massachusetts, are injured or killed by these traps. This is a, a photo of a cat, family cat named August to the right who um, came back one afternoon and with the, the trap around their midsection and the um, owner said that the, the more they struggled to pull it off, the tighter and tighter the, the trap got on them. Um, leg hold traps crush bone, muscle fiber, tendons and connective tissue and they often result in amputation and death. And I'm sure we all remember last year uh, when locally two little foxes got trapped uh, in illegal leg holds um, in the area. This is one of them, probably the lucky one who just ended up, uh, with, ended up surviving, but his legs was amputated. And the second fox, we don't know what happened to. Um, often animals who are caught in leg traps die painful deaths by shock, injury, blood loss or predation. And so personally, when I think of all this, I just wonder why anybody would even want to sell or buy new fur products when it comes from such inhumane and incredible suffering. The fur industry also takes a huge toll on our environment. And this also runs counter to Arlington's local voting record that supports sustainable environmental and climate issues. This slide shows just several of the recent votes um, that we've taken here in Arlington. Fur farms consistently violate environmental regulations. Fur tanning and dressing uses carcinogenic toxins such as chromium and formaldehyde to prevent the skin from decaying. And these toxins as well as manure and carcasses get thrown into wetlands and seep into watersheds. Next slide, please. Studies by the Independent Environmental Sustainability Group, CE Delft, 
in Europe have shown that fur is the highest offending textile, natural or synthetic, with the worst impact per pound in 17 of 18 environmental categories, including climate change, waste runoff, and toxicity. The climate change impact of mink fur is at least six times higher than faux fur. And knowing what we do, we cannot justify the harm the industry does to the environment. It's simply unnecessary. There's numerous eco-friendly faux furs that have been developed in the last years that look like real fur, but without the environmental damage. Thanks. Fur farming affects health of humans as well. Since April 2020, you may have read that COVID-19 outbreaks occurred in more than 450 mink farms in Europe and North America including 16 farms here in the United States. Over 20 million animals were slaughtered as a result. And scientists are concerned that animal to human contagion may mutate the virus, leading to new variants that are contagious to humans and thus decrease the vaccine efficacy. As I close tonight, I want to share that this Warren article is supported by the MSPCA, Save Arlington's Wildlife, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Animal Legal Defense Fund. The language of this bylaw has been approved by the Attorney General after it was passed in Wellesley in 2020. And since then, Brookline, Weston, Cambridge, Lexington, and Plymouth have passed similar bylaws. Passing this warrant article is the right thing to do for animals, for the environment, and for humans. And it will have no economic impact on businesses that currently exist in Arlington. We don't always have the opportunity to do the right thing without repercussions, but we do this time. By passing this bylaw, we once again write our community values into law, showing that Arlington is a town that is free of cruel practices and supports animal, environmental, and human health. Again, we cannot stop this industry until we stop the demand for products. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, thank you for the presentation. Um, happy to support this. I just want one question. So what was the rationale for excluding secondhand shops? So, so, not, so not affecting them? Correct. Um, I think that we wanted to get it passed. <laughs> That's so, so there, I, um, I think that also the, those products have been sold like they're not a demand like that for the, for new products that feeds the industry, so I think. I mean, I, I think it's fine as it is. <laughs> I just think you know, I also, you know, if you're going to exclude the sale of fur, then you know you can say a, a secondhand shop. I don't know if we just have one, but you know, whatever's in your inventory, you can sell. You've already bought that from somebody, but going forward, don't buy any fur products to sell in your, in your business, but. Argument for another day, I guess. So. Any other preliminary questions or comments from the board? Okay, at this time, let's open this up for public comment. So this is a public hearing. As a reminder, there's a three minute, uh, come on up, Carrie, a three minute uh, time limit for public comment. And we'll alternate between people uh, in the room and on Zoom. If you are on Zoom and wish to comment on this article, please raise your hand at this time and then we will call you um, in turn with uh, in-person participants. Good evening, sir. Please introduce yourself. <coughs> Absolutely. Uh, Chair, members of the select board, Carrie Teal at 11A Lakeview Street. Lived in Arlington for 17 years now. Feels like I moved in yesterday. Um, Co-founder of an international animal protection group that's based our headquarters literally a stone's throw from where we are right now. And I'll use less than three minutes, but I just want to say uh, I'm very proud to live in this town. I'm very proud that our nonprofit is based here because Arlington has proven to be extremely animal friendly and in fact a leader on these issues. Um, I was very grateful uh, to work with, with Mr. Feeney uh, and mem many members of the select board over the past couple of years uh, on the rodenticide issue. Um, very proud of the work we did together on that. And it was incredible after it passed, you know, I, I not only heard from 
uh, citizens across the state who said, you know, give us your advice on how to do this in our community. I heard from national organizations. I mean, we clearly had a profound impact when we did that together. And I think that's something we should all view as, as a victory, not only for the animals, but for the town. Um, so I, I'm really excited to be here tonight because I think these are three really fantastic warrant articles. Um, I'm going to ask for your support as we go through the night on all three. Um, uh, I, I, on this one in particular, I would just point out that, you know, as uh, Ms. Dre, who's a fantastic champion of this issue, as she said, you know, Arlington, when this, when this has been on the ballot, you know, in, in 2008, uh, the ballot question I worked on regarding Greyhound racing, that passed with 63% of the vote. Uh, when in 1996, the, when leg hole trapping was prohibited statewide, the Arlington vote was 74%. And so I, I think you look at that 74% number, that is where the community is on this. And I'm, I'm certain that if the vote were today, those numbers would be even higher. So I, I think this is a fantastic warrant article and I ask for your support. Thank you, sir. Let's now turn to Zoom and Ms. Mark, you can bring in one of the uh, people with their hands raised. Looks like that's Sadie Ford. All right. Give Sadie Ford a chance to come in. Good evening. You can uh, turn off your, yeah, you're good to go. All right. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sadie Ford. I'm 17 years old. I live at 124 Brattle Street, and I'm currently attending Arlington High School. I ask for your support for this article because I think it's amazing. It is making sure that we allow for the protection of animals in the future. And it also is making sure that Arlington isn't going to be actively adding to the profit of the fur, well, actively giving profit to fur farms. And I just think that if we have this, in addition to Lexington, Cambridge, Wellesley, Weston, Brooklyn, and Plymouth, then we can join a legacy that's promoting um, cruelty, well, an animal cruelty-free zone in our zone in Massachusetts. So, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for participating in your town's public uh, discussion and democracy. Uh, Mr. Feeney, just for the sake of the Zoom, could you um, end the slide share, please? Is anybody in the room uh, who would like to, wish to comment on this article before we move back to Zoom? Okay, seeing none, let's bring in our other Zoom uh, attendee who had their hand raised, if they're still there. I believe that's Laura Kiesel. <clears throat> Good evening, Ms. Kiesel. Hi. Hi, it's Laura Kiesel, Precinct 7. I live on Everett Street. Um, and I'm going to be presenting in a few minutes on another animal article, but I just wanted to offer my perspective really quickly as the founder and director of Save Arlington Wildlife. When um, the two fox, fox kits were um, caught in the illegal lake hold traps last year, I was the one who was getting kind of inundated with emails. It was very clear that uh, the consensus in Arlington was a lot of outrage about these uh, traps. And as we know by ballot question in the 1990s, uh, we have rejected these lake hold traps, but a lot of people were surprised when I educated them that these lake hold traps are still used across the region in many of our neighboring states. And we still import um, as a state a lot of fur products that do trap animals by that method, in, in which case our state is sort of still um, proactively supporting that practice, even if we banned it inside the state by importing fur products that were from animals that have been trapped by lake hold traps. So I did get a lot of people even then writing me and saying, well, we don't want those fur products in Arlington. So I just wanted to offer that perspective as well. As um, Elizabeth Dre mentioned, the vast majority are from fur farms, which are cruel and environmentally um, hazardous, but these lake hold traps are another practice by which fur is sourced. And I also wanted to address John Hurd's uh, question about uh, consignment shops for used fur. One of the reasons that I know that Elizabeth didn't do that is right now, I don't think there's really much of a precedent. All the other communities have 
emphasize new fur products. And since there are these used fur products are already in the system, it kind of supports the recycling of them with saying like, we have that, we can use those, but please let's stop sourcing these and harming the animals that are around. So thank you very much for taking my comments. Thank you very much for your comment. Any other comments in Zoom or in the room on this article? Okay, Ms. R, Ms. Mar for Zoom. Seeing no hands raised. Okay, this concludes the public hearing. Attorney Cunningham. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to note I've been in communication with Ms. Dre, and um, there was I know there's some there's a draft motion in the material that was provided to the select board. Uh, Ms. Dre has requested that that draft motion be amended to include some additional language, specifically in section one, uh, mention of the threat the fur farms present to public health. Uh, the environmental impact, the negative environmental impact that fur production has, and um, that the elimination of sale fur products will decrease the demand for those. Um, also, Ms. Dre asked for an amendment to, or revision to Section 5, the penalty. Currently in the select board materials, it's a penalty of $100 in Section 5. Ms. Dre has asked that that be increased to $300. I would just note that to the extent the board is inclined to support those changes, um, they would have, net, in my opinion, would have no negative impact on the legality of this proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, at this time I'll turn to the board for any further discussion and motions. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I'd like to move approval with the two amendments to section one and section five. Second. Okay. Any discussion, Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, th thank you, Ms. Dre, for the presentation and, and for providing us links to the uh, to both the House and the Senate bill. And, and I think this is, for me, where um, it's important to do what you're asking here, and particularly where uh, we there are bills pending in the legislature. I, just a question, do you know, is this the first time these bills are pending, or have they been filed in previous sessions and just haven't gotten out of committee? Ms. Dre? Yes, thank you. It's my understanding this is their second time okay. being heard. Okay, thank you. So, so for me, this is the type of thing where the Attorney General has already passed on municipalities um, being authorized to, to, to pass a bylaw, and, and I think it's important to send a message to the legislature, too, that um, there are six communities. It would be great if we're the, we're the seventh here. Um, and until this is a state law, it, it seems appropriate to be uh, within our town bylaws. So I'm happy to support it and thank you for, for the um, extensive information for us. Thank you. thank you very much, sir. Any further discussion by the board? I'm also delighted to support this. Thank you for your work on this. I think that it says a lot about a community and, a, uh, and about a town and, and how we treat the vulnerable and how we treat uh, those without a voice. And I include our animal friends in that, and I appreciate the heart and the hard work that went into this. And I hope the town meeting also does as well. Thank you. I think we're ready for a vote on a motion for favorable action by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate your support. We now turn to Article 16 for a bylaw amendment, the pet sale restrictions and uh, regarding retail pet sales. And uh, Ms. Marty, are you aware of who the proponent speaking tonight is? Um, I've promoted both Asia Kepka and Laura Kiesel as they okay. have both submitted more an article reference. I'm sorry, they both? Support. Um, They're both proponents? Yeah. Co-proponents, okay. <laughs> All right, so... Um, Please proceed with your good evening. Please introduce yourselves and uh, proceed with your presentation, please. Good evening. Um, this is Asha Kepka, um, town meeting member from Precinct 1. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very much so. Okay. Um, many years ago, I went to buy dog food and I came home with 10 most beautiful goldfish and a tiny fish tank. I was told by the salesperson that, you know, they're tiny, they don't need much. Um, very quickly I learned that we're gonna need a bigger tank. Um, hundreds of dollars later, and many years later, um, the four surviving goldfish were thriving. I named them uh, Pale Bob, Bob the Communist, Gay Bob, and Bernie Frank. Um, I 
was dedicated a pet owner, so I was able to educate myself and keep my fish happy. But many people who purchase animals in pet stores um, are not always able to um, be responsible pet owners for whatever reasons. Um, one in four pets purchased in pet store uh, surrendered to pet uh, to animal shelters and over a million cats and dogs uh, being euthanized every year. Um, I understand that um, pet stores are businesses and they have to make money to sell the product, uh, which is animals and animal products. Um, I would like to introduce Laura Kishel to speak uh, in depth about uh, the Article 16, um, about the burden that many um, animal shelters are facing um, with uh, excess of uh, pets purchased from the pet stores. Okay, Ms. Kiesel. Thanks. So I don't know if I, do I say next slide if I want to go to the next one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next slide. So the overview is similar to the pet, uh, the fur ban that we just reviewed. Uh, this would help, this would be a ban on pet stores for new sales of animals. And that would apply to dogs, cats, mammal, all mammals, as well as birds, reptiles, and amphibians. It does not apply to animal shelters or private breeders. This is mostly about pet mills and poaching of animals from the wild that we're trying to crack down on. This would allow pet shops to have partnerships with rescues and animal shelters to help adopt out animals, which is different than selling them for profit. And similar to the fur ban, it would be a preventative measure because right now Arlington does not sell any animals as pets. Next slide, please. Um, so currently 2.6 million puppies every year come from puppy mills and it's a competitive number around that for kittens as well. Next slide, please. But a lot of times in these conversations, we only talk about puppies and kittens, but this happens to a lot of animals. Uh, other mammals like rabbits, ferrets, guinea pigs, birds like parrots and parakeets, reptile species such as turtles, snakes and lizards, and amphibians like frogs and salamanders. Next slide, please. So why we're interested in this, U.S. pet dealers are ta taking in and importing 225 million live animals on average, and that is with stricter federal laws than 20 or 30 years ago. And this is essentially endangering wild species around the globe in their native habitats. Some examples of that are the African gray parrot, which are right now are a very popular pet, and the Madagascar tortoise. And these animals suffer and die during capture and transport, as well as once they're in these pet mills, they're living in very cramped and inhumane conditions. Next slide, please. For instance, birds, 75 to 90% of wild caught birds die before the point of sale and taking birds from the wild has negative impacts on global biodiversity. And birds are not actually um, protected under the Animal Welfare Act, like a lot of mammal species are, and there's no federal oversight of pet stores or bird mills. So these industrialized parrot mills will ha often house hundreds of birds in rows of bearing cages, and they don't get any enrichment or interaction, even though they're very intelligent animals. And the other problem is a lot of times when people can't keep these birds or they can't handle their care, they just release them into the environment. Currently in the United States, we have 56 parrot species that are not native to our country that are present. And in 43 of those states and 25 of those species are actively breeding. And they're crowding out our native songbirds. And one um, very popular example of that is the monk parakeet pictured here. They have populations in Massachusetts as well. Next slide, please. And reptiles and amphibians, there's, they suffer similar fates as birds. 75% of pet snakes, lizards, and tortoises die within the first year in the home. Similar to birds, the Animal Welfare Act does not cover them at all. Also, 75% of new diseases usually, that usually spread between people and animals are usually transmitted by wild pets, and reptiles in particular are a large source of that. Just this past August, the CDC had an advisory because there was an 11-state outbreak of salmonella linked to pet turtles. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this was another really sad case of a pet. This was right here in Massachusetts in the Boston metro area, a pet chameleon. Someone got from a local pet store in the area. And when the person couldn't handle its care, they have very high maintenance needs. They neglected it and then dumped it with a wildlife rehabber. So not only are these animals being released into the environment or abandoned, a lot of times even wildlife rehabbers that are supposed to be caring for our native wildlife are being saddled with this care. And this poor animal had to be euthanized because it was in such rough, rough shape. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanna talk just for a quick minute or so about the case of red-eared sliders. Uh, this is a kind of turtle. 15 or 20 years ago, you could go into any pet store in Massachusetts just about, and you could find these guys. You could buy half a dozen of them. But a decade ago, in 2014, Massachusetts had to ban their sale. And the reason Mass Wildlife did this is because, quote, so many unwanted pet turtles were being released that they were now establishing a bre breeding non-native turtle populations in parts of the state. The picture you see on the right, that's a red-eared slider right on the Mystic River here that borders Medford and Arlington. And I was seeing this turtle in December because it, you know they're not acclimated to our weather. I think it was a dumped pet. It would come on the shore and stuff. So it's cruel to these animals that are being released in the, in the, to the environment, but it's also cruel for the native species that are getting crowded out. So as the MSPCA PCA noted, red-eared sliders now compete with our native turtles, including our threatened and endangered species for space and resources. Um, and even though now they're banned, there are other up and coming turtle pet, pet turtle species that are also potentially a risk to become dumped in our native waters. Next slide, please. So sometimes people say, well, aren't there enough federal and state regulations? And the truth is they fall short. USDA standards for care of animals in pet stores are minimal. They are very hard to enforce. And the truth of the matter is most of the store, pet shops that sell animals, they are buying from breeders and pet mills outside of Massachusetts. So our state laws don't really apply for their care there. Um, so we need more local actions to fill the gaps. Next slide, please. Um, and similar to the fur ban, right now we have no shops in Arlington that sell animals, even fish. And we do have a local pet co in Arlington Heights and it only sells uh, goods and services. And we like to keep it that way because a lot of other municipalities are enacting sales on pet stores selling live animals. And what we're worried about is that as the, that market shrinks and shifts, they're going to try to migrate into our town and, uh, and we'd like to prevent that. Next slide, please. Uh, many other municipalities have enacted similar legislation. Currently, 14 towns and cities in Massachusetts have enacted some kind of pet sale ban. Uh, this includes Cambridge, Lexington, Plymouth, Springfield, Brookline, Boston, and Stoneham, among others. Cambridge, our next door neighbor, has enacted the most comprehensive pet sale ban and is the one we're trying to emulate now that also extends not just to mammals um, like dogs, cats, and rabbits, but also birds, reptiles, and amphibians. And the PetSmart in Cambridge, in Fresh Pond, they actually did have a transition period, but I believe the select board is in possession of a letter from the then mayor, Mark McGovern, who's still a current city councilor there in Cambridge, who noted that there was minimal impact and it turned out to be a net positive for the community. And that was with actually having to transition out of selling pets. Uh, next slide, please. So again, there should be no economic impact whatsoever in Arlington. This is a good time to act because we do not have to have any kind of transition period. Next slide. Uh, we have widespread support. Many Arlington residents signed our warrant petition, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 or 70 signatures in 48 hours. And in addition to large animal welfare groups like the MSPCA, the Animal Defense League, Boston Animal Rescue League, we also had a lot of smaller rescues of groups of animals like rabbits and parrots that also signed on to support our bill. I think you, you got many letters of supports by the parrot rescues that work in, in and around Massachusetts, the rabbit rescues, as well as smaller local dog and rescues such as Broken Tail Rescue, which actually works in and around Arlington and adopts their cats out of the Fresh Pond in Cambridge. So that is an example, working example we have nearby of a partnership between a pet store helping to adopt out animals. And we also have an endorsement by the Turtle Rescue League, which in addition to being a rehabber for native turtles and deals a lot with the crowding out of those native turtles, also tries to get pet turtles 
out of the system so that they will not be dumped in our native um, ponds and rivers. Next slide. So this is really a four component warrant. We are looking to prevent these pet sales from coming into Arlington. We're also hoping to help boost the chances of state legislation. I do think there's been some proposed legislation. I think it mostly is for mammals right now, but we still hope that maybe this will help um, offer them some leverage. We also wanna be consistent with our values as a humane community and build on that. And again, we have very strong constituent and organizational support from across the board. So just wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to me and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I will add uh, just as a point of further information for my colleagues, I did uh, take a Cambridge Councilor Mark McGovern up in his offer to us to to have a conversation, I did so this weekend. He's currently the vice mayor of, of Cambridge, and he shared, uh, as Ms. Kiesel said, that the transition went really well, and also that they found that even in retail stop shops that were uh, selling animals, it was only about five percent of their revenue. You know that they most make most of the money on supplies and, and food and things, um, and so it really wasn't an issue. And um, really had a minimum of, of resident complaints about the restrictions. And that there, he noted to us in his letter. Uh, that I believe is on file uh, in our uh, webpage, that uh, the, the proposal before us by the proponents is, is matches Cambridge's and its restrictions, which you know, which are pretty broad. And um, so it was it was helpful, I think, to to get a sense for their successful experience with this. Um, any uh, other initial questions or comments from the board, Mr. Hurd? Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I just. That's sort of an anecdotal story that came up as I was listening to the presentation where, you know, and I guess it kind of just shows that like these pet shops have people that are trained and people that aren't. When my boys were younger, we they wanted a pet. We settled on a fish. We went to Petco in Cambridge and they each picked out a fish. They went through the whole, everything we needed, you know, from the tank to everything in the tank, showed me how to create the tank. You know, I had to go one day and come back and pick them up and it, it, it seemed very comprehensive and I felt like I was in good hands and we brought them home and the only thing that they didn't tell us is that you can't put two beta fish in one tank. Oh. <laughs> so one of my son's fish killed my other son's fish and oh. that was uh, a little bit of a stressful night for one of my sons. That night, so I mean, it just you know, I, I don't mean to sit to make light of a situation like that, but I mean, it does show that you know, there are real consequences to this. So, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Any other comments from the board before we turn to the public for comment? Okay, let's start the phone. Oh, oh, there he is, Mr. Diggins. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Can we uh, terminate the slide share as well, please, Mr. Diggins? Yeah. And, and, and you know, I'm inclined to support this, and you know, it'll take a lot to reverse my um, position, but of course I'll listen um, to what people have to say. But building on with, with what Mr. Hurd um, said, I am curious, I mean, that it doesn't include fish. I mean, that doesn't matter, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, especially also um, taking into account Aja's um, beginning to our presentation um, related to yeah. fish. I actually kind of wish maybe we did, but I think one of the reasons we were hesitant is currently that I don't think there are any other municipalities that have expanded to fish yet. Um, I even Cambridge, that's the they still sell fish even though they've banned every other class, like you know uh, reptiles, mammals, bird, uh, birds, amphibians, uh, but they haven't done fish. And I do think there's a lot of ecological reasons to consider fish as well. I'm open to that because I. I have a beta fish right now, and I, I do have a lot of problems with, with the industry, is, and, and a lot of the same arguments apply, both the ecological argument, because there are a lot of non-native fish that get dumped in our waterways, but also the, the humane and welfare issues, too. But just since no other community had tried it yet, I was hesitant to add them to the list. I got you. So, Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Chair, can I ask um, Mr. Cunningham? Question yes. regarding this? I, in fact, I think he's, he's expecting one, so go right ahead. <laughs> okay, Mr. Cunningham, then you probably know the question. Go ahead and answer it. <laughs> I think the proponents correctly state that there is no other community that has included fish in a bylaw that has been approved by the municipal law unit. 
However, I think that there's a decent chance that uh, if this were presented to the Attorney General's office, it would probably be acceptable. I can't guarantee that result, but I don't think this would have an adverse impact if fish were included in the bylaw. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'll leave it to the proponents, I mean, if you want to go for fish, you know. I, I would yeah. like to include fish if that, if, if yeah. the town council is confident, is relatively confident that they think that, if they had a problem with that, they wouldn't strike down the whole thing, right? They would just remove that aspect of it, wouldn't compromise the entire warrant if it became a bylaw. Mr. Chair, I'm turning on him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Kiesel, I could answer you directly. Most likely that would be the result. I can, again, I can't guarantee what the Attorney General's office would do uh, based on some uh, hypothetical consideration of this, but most likely in those okay. situations, most likely in that situation, the Attorney General's office would probably contact the town and see if that could be um, removed. And if the rest of it, and we could also add a uh, severability clause in there if the, if the board's inclined. Okay. Is that okay with Asia? Yeah, if I may, um, actually, I know a lot of people who do release the goldfish into small ponds near their homes, um, you know, home builds. So I would suspect that some people also release uh, fish into a public w waterways, which can create problems because some fish you can purchase that are already sick and can carry diseases. So I think um, I would welcome inclu inclusion of the fish as well. Well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I wasn't sure, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm all done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May I suggest as, a, as an alternative, perhaps adding a separate section with fish mm -hmm. so that there is already a severability clause contained in the draft motion. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the, that would give the Attorney General the option to just strike that one portion. All right. Yeah. So if the board would, uh, wants to make that suggestion, then that be, we'll follow that advice. Okay. Any further comment from uh, questions for the board? All right, let's do public comment on this one. We haven't done public comment yet, have we? No. All right, so this is now a public hearing on Article 16. If you are uh, on Zoom and wish to comment on this article, please raise your hand in Zoom, and likewise, if you are in the room. Um, let's start with Mr. Veal. <coughs> Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How many views on fish? We'd be happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, Carrie Teal, 11A Lakeview Street, Arlington. Um, this is going to be the shortest testimony, I think, of the night. Uh, I just wanted to thank Ms. Keisel for her incredibly hard work on this. Uh, when we got together, her and myself and Paul Schlickman and Christine Dorchak, a couple months ago and started talking about the prospect of doing several animal welfare warrant articles, uh, I knew that that was a group that could get a lot done. So I, I'm very, very proud of, of that. And uh, this is a good warrant article. I ask for your support. 28 seconds, you might have the record. <laughs> uh, Mr. Cook. Grant Cook, Precinct 16. Um, yeah, actually I'm in support of the article. I, I, our pet was a rescue. But there is one place in Arlington where you can buy shellfish and they're used for consumption. So if you go down that path, I assume food usage would be waved off. So that's all I'd say. <laughs> I assume the uh, town council has duly noted that suggestion. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody in Zoom or in the room wish to comment? Well, we'll just have to draft that artfully that someone can't just say, hey, you know, this is for consumption. So. Yeah, my, my, actually, the, that is an interesting gray area. You know, if, you're buying, if you're buying a live lobster, yeah. <laughs> speaks to purpose. I wonder if that has why communities have not gone this route. <laughs> Mr. Jordan-Gunningham. Gunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to speculate too much, but I think that's probable. Um, but that's why it would, it would make some sense to add it as a separate section with a yeah. you know, inclusion for consumption, and then the Attorney General may object to it. See, the, the one thing I'd add, I mean, the fish store isn't going to qualify as a pet shop, as defined here. So, I think we're, I think oh, yeah. we'll be okay. Yeah. A reasonable, reasonable point. All right. Um, thank you. Any other public comment? Yeah. Anything in Zoom? No okay. Yet. So this includes the public uh, hearing portion of this. I'll now turn to the board for further discussion and motions. Mrs. Mahan. I'd like to uh, 
move approval with the amendment it would be under section two to add uh, to read prohibition of the sale of mammals birds reptiles amphibians and fish and just one question through you mr chair um in my correct town council that the citation for severability that's in section three is that to which you're referring yes mrs mon okay thank you I just wanted to make sure it's in there. Okay. And uh, with your motion to approval, is that with or without fish? With. Okay, I'm looking for a second or for second. discussion? Okay. Any further discussion from the board? Okay. I think we're good to go. So, uh, Trey Cunningham, do you have the guidance that you need for the drafting? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion to approve with the uh, amendment as suggested by the proponents to include fish by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney, Cunning, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Thank you much for your work on this article. Thank you. Brings us to Thank Article you. 17, Bylaw Amendment, Right to Pet Companionship. Mr. Slickman, introduce your uh, co-presenter as well, or introduce yourself first. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Paul Slickman, Precinct 9, Town Meeting Member. Christine Dorshak is also one of the original 10 proponents. Precinct 8, Lakeview Street. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Unlike the uh, two articles that you've heard previous to this one, this would be the first enactment of an article of this nature in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The other articles made it through review by the State Attorney General. They are the authority for determining whether or not an, uh, a bylaw is valid. That's because we're a town and they treat us as a large, sophisticated town with competent counsel, the same as they would treat a very small town with an open town meeting that would just pass almost anything out of a whim because it's a small, open town meeting. So in that context, I'm asking you to support this as a bylaw amendment that would be destined for review and would set a precedent for either being a valid bylaw or something that need, we would need to go through another route, say uh, a, a um, home rule petition or statewide legislation. The bylaw that I've presented to you is modeled on two sources. One is current law in California, and the other is federal housing policy. These protections that we offer for tonight for pet owners are enshrined in federal policy for projects that are federally funded. So what we are doing is extending rights that people who live in Arlington in federally funding housing have and bringing that forward to every resident of the town of Arlington. And we are including the fish. We are including the fish. And so the animal companions we're talking about are any kind of animal who is commonly kept inside as a pet, sleeps inside, such as a dog, cat, rabbit, bird, fish, hamster, gerbil, or other animal typ typically resides and sleeps indoors. In, in drafting this, we looked for reasons why somebody would object to this bylaw, and California already scoped out some conditions and exceptions, and we've expanded upon them. Notably, that uh, ADUs are exempt, roommate situations are exempt, and two family homes where one resident is the owner are exempt from this bylaw. So we're only basing this on larger or more commercial operations and exempting very small uh, human relationships, which really aren't the source of the problem. 
but that's sort of the genesis of this. And there are a lot of protections within the exemptions in terms of maintaining standards uh, of, of neutering or spaying a pet with the exception of the fish. We're not going to spay the fish. Um, that do dogs should be appropriate licensed. That all applicable state and local public health animal control and animal anti-cruelty laws are in place. And I would like to go and read to you a letter that you have received from uh, the Massachusetts Association of, uh, the Mass Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and the Animal Rescue League of Boston. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read you uh, a couple of paragraphs which really state the need. And the need is founded in the fact that we have a very, very, very tight housing market. And the letter uh, uh, states as follows. The Massachusetts Society for the Preservation and uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and the Animal Rescue League of Boston are writing to ask for your support for Article 17 on the warrant for the upcoming town meeting. The article would require rental agreements and condominium associations to per permit residents to own a common household pet or to have a common household pet present in the dwelling. The housing shortage crisis affecting every community in Massachusetts is exacerbated for families with animals. Often owners are forced to surrender a family pet because they cannot find inclusive housing. Nearly three in four renters have pets, but others are forced to relinquish their pets to shelters, ripping those families apart. Some people choose homelessness rather than separation from their four-legged family members. Being forced to choose between a beloved pet and a safe home has detrimental impacts on people's physical health and emotional well-being, not to mention that it contributes directly to the higher intake rate at animal shelters of healthy, adoptable dogs and cats each year. Shelter Animals Count tracks data on animals and shelters across the country. The organization found the number of cats and dogs euthanized and that died in shelters increased nationwide in 2013 by 15% compared to 2022 and 29% compared to 2021. In Massachusetts, this increase was 5% compared to 2022 and 18% compared to 2021. Policies that permit pets and housing help reduce the number of homeless animals. According to the National Council on Pet Population Study and Policy, moving is the most cited reason people give for surrendering the animals to shelters, with landlord issues close behind. Our Massachusetts shelters similarly find these reasons just as prevalent. Pet owners make very good renters. A study shows the average length in Tennessee of renters with pets is more than twice that of renters without pets. Another study found that statistically pet owners do not do more damage to rental units than people who don't own pets. A poll conducted by the Humane Society of the United States showed that 35% of people without pets would own one if their rentals permitted it. We appreciate Arlington's recognition of the special role pets play in our families and the consideration of protecting people's right to correct pet can, can to pet can the right to pet companionship by expanding pet inclusive housing in town. I'll now pass the discussion on to Christine. My name's Christine Dorchak and I'm an animal protection attorney. I live and work in Arlington and I'm one of the 10 signers to this proposed Article 17. I apologize, I'm gonna be referring to my notes because I only learned of uh, town council's analysis while driving to a hearing in New Hampshire this morning. So I'm <laughs> gonna to refer to my notes if you don't mind. So I'm here tonight to express concerns with the analysis of town council and raising questions about the lawfulness of this local bylaw to encourage and allow the keeping of companion animals. This is a very good public policy for all the reasons Paula stated. I hope you'll support it tonight. 
um, respectfully. Town Council is relying on the 1993 Noble case, but this simply does not decide the issue. All this, um, although this matter was heard in Norfolk County and appealed by the couple, it became moot in a very key sense. One of the members of the couple, Margaret Wilson, and the two companion dogs that were at issue were killed together in an accident during the pendency of the matter. So no further appeal was taken for obvious reasons. The Noble case could also be distinguished um, because it involved a condominium. A condominium, as we all, all know, is an association, and an association may have reasonable rules. These rules could even amount to a restrictive scheme, as long as it is one that is appropriately formalized and related to the health, happiness, and peace of mind of unit owners. So condominiums have, in effect, their own private bylaws, consisting of rules that each unit owner has agreed to, uh, to as part of a private community. Some associations may allow companion animals, some may not. The rules can, in fact, be restrictive or permissive. So personally, I live in a condominium where, thankfully, companion animals are permitted. I moved here several years ago after being forced to leave my apartment in Boston where I had lived quite happily for 20 years. But I was forced to move because uh, my landlord imposed a new rule through, uh, that was brought to his attention uh, by the new condo association. And this rule laid down that no new dogs would be allowed. Well, this was simply not acceptable to me. Dogs are a part of my life. So um, in this sense, I've lived and breathed the problem that this uh, Article 17 would seek to solve. I was fortunate that I could afford to move here and live in a beautiful place in Arlington. But this is not possible for many people. They would be forced due to economics to make life and death decisions about their dog or cat or be evicted. That's just the kind of unfortunate situation that, again, this proposed bylaw looks to prevent. So setting the noble, the 1993 case aside, I would like the, to call the board's attention to uh, more applicable law. Um, in my opinion, uh, the 1975 Supreme Judicial Court matter in which the court declined to rule on the enforceability of general pet restrictions is really what we should be guided by right now. The court would express no opinion, quote, whether a pet restriction by law would be lawful in all circumstances. So for all intents and purposes, the issue of whether the condominium associations or rental unit owners in general are free to restrict companion animals from their premises is an open one. It is far from settled, and current law does not act as a bar to town action on this article. <clears throat> Further, another important aspect to consider is whether rules intended to protect the peace of mind of fellow, ten fellow tenants under Massachusetts General Law Chapter 183A11, as cited by town council, can even be lawfully applied to individual units versus just to common areas. In other words, conduct or activity within an individual's place of abode is protected as a general rule. A 2010 case in Suffolk County, as well as a Middlesex case in 2010, held that residential association rules and regulations may only apply to common areas. In conclusion, and thank you for your patience tonight with my reading, given the unsettled law and the fact that there is no controlling law against quote unquote pets in housing, I would urge the town to approve Article 17 our proposed bylaw advocates for the town to adopt a permissive scheme, just as my landlord has already done, one that will allow local residents to enjoy the companionship of cats and dogs without fear of harassment or eviction. If the board feels that excluding, excluding <coughs> private condominium associations from the bylaw is warranted, that would still create a good policy for our town. I would also add that uh, the petitioner is not claiming a constitutional right to keep pets. So no constitutional analysis is required. The federal law on the keeping of service dogs by persons with disabilities, also referred to in town council's analysis, is in fact an example of permission and not of restriction. I would urge the board to review this point carefully. Companion animals, particularly dogs and cats, are members of our family. The petitioner is simply asking the town to recognize this. Those who share their hearts in their homes with forfeited friend, friends and fish should be allowed to do so peacefully and not under the threat of eviction. I think Arlington can set a new standard on this issue. 
Thank you very much. Um, forgive me if you've done this, but um, could we get a, 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 a kind of a concise summary of exactly what actions this bylaw would require? Okay, let me pull it back up. Um, essentially, and I uh, just lost it. The, the bylaw is before you, and what it's basically saying that if a landlord who is, or a condo association under the terms of this bylaw, would not be able to just blanketly ban uh, animal companions. The landlord could, or condo association, could make reasonable restrictions based on the conduct of the animal so that an animal that is a nuisance could be prohibited, a loud animal could be prohibited, a, 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 an animal that disturbs the neighborhood or the neighbors could, or does damage could be prohibited. Nothing in this is going to go after the reasonable right of people who neighbor a, a unit with an animal is going to be bothered by this. What it's saying is, for the most part, most animal owners, you wouldn't know they have an animal. We have a lot of cats and a few dogs in my building. I don't know where they are, except for the, the fact that I can see the Chewy shipments coming in in the front <laughs> lobby. There's very little evidence, and in the 21 years I've lived in the building, we've had absolutely no problems with animals in the building. Nobody knows where I've got a cat, except the fact that my cat has a Facebook page. The cat has been somewhat effective in terms of dealing with the occasional mouse that appears. Uh, so there are benefits to having an animal, and as long as the animal does not create a nuisance, the, a landlord or condo association will have the right to make reasonable restrictions on that. It's the blanket prohibition that we're looking to get rid of. Thank you. Um, I think I'll continue with a couple of questions, but it'll kind of kick off the, the point of the, the board making uh, initial comments and questions. Um, Mr. Slickman, thank you for your presentation. So, and I also want to, I will give Trudy Cunningham a chance uh, when he's ready to make any, any remarks um, regarding the, the legal analysis too. Um, so we'll get that in this round as well. Um, when, you, when you talk about reasonable restrictions for nuisance animals and <laughs> behavior, I'm trying to think how that would apply in practice. And I think what comes to mind is that there would have to be a provision for the animal to be removed. Um, because you, you know, unless you, I mean, you, you, you can't, you sort of can't write into the association knowing in advance what you don't know if an animal's gonna be a problem um, for noise or for behavior. So does the bylaw contemplate or do you have a suggestion for what the bylaw should do um, to provide for what actually happens if, if an animal proves to be problematic? In the, under that circumstance? The exceptions state nothing in the section precludes an owner or condominium association from enforcing reasonable rules relating to the number of size of pets and in terms of the, uh, the, the actions, the, the, the nuisance factor within it. I mean, just as you, just as the town of Arlington does not prohibit residents of the town of Arlington from having a dog, you have the right to remove a dog from the town if it is unlicensed or you, uh, you, or you determine that the dog is presenting a hazard to other residents of the town. I would assume that a condo association would be able to set up a bylaw that would provide some sort of a similar mechanism for dealing with the occasional instance where a pet may be a nuisance to others in the building. And what about rental agreements for uh, for renters? Uh, similar to that, yeah. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, okay, mm -hmm. any other, we will turn to Attorney Cunningham, um, but any questions at this point for the board or comments? Uh, attorney, um, <laughs> well, you are attorney DeCourcy, but <laughs> not in this role. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Schlickman, just a question. You, you cited the California experience. Is that, there's a bill pending in California. Is that what you're referring to? There's also existing law. Um, Ms. Dorachek, I believe, uh, has researched what the, the current situation is in California. Could, the, the, could they, you tell they have an additional law being filed that would strengthen their, their existing okay. uh, it, it seems to me the, the, the bill, I believe, is AB 2216, that, that was just 
filed that seems to um, attempt to address or even looking more forward what, what you're trying to do here. But if you could maybe enlighten us a little bit on, on what, what's happening with that, because I'm not aware of any other statutes anywhere that deal specifically with the issue that you're bringing before us. Well, in code now, uh, California allows pets in state housing. Okay. The, the new measure would now expand that to any housing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Attorney Cunningham, do you have any comments at this stage? Um, yes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have concerns. They're set forth in the memo. Uh, Deputy Town Council Attorney Munson uh, was involved in the drafting of that. I think that the significant concern I have is that we're it would be creating a, pro a prohibition that you know, is claiming discrimination. Uh, discrimination, particularly in the housing field, is typically something that deals discriminate based on age, or disability, ethnicity, gender. Um, there's no known right that I'm aware of to pet ownership, this, despite the fact that I would love if they, if they were uh, as, mm -hmm. as a proud pet owner. Um, so I'm just concerned about the legality of this entire concept. Um, I think that the fact that there's no other municipality or state that I know is pending legislation has done this to date is telling. I think this is, an, uh, this is a field of law that's occupied by the, the federal government, to some lesser extent the state government, and it would be, it's, it's inappropriate for municipalities to try and occupy this field. I think I'm also concerned about some, the discrimination language is particularly concerning because discrimination requires a protected class and certainly pet owners aren't qualified uh, under, uh, they're not a protected class. And I'm also concerned about one of the conditions and exceptions provision that talks about, you know, accepting civil liability for owners of housing. Um, I just think that's a concern where it's an attempt to dictate legal liability via bylaw, um, which is another concern. Um, I also think that the, the enforcement provisions that were cited by the chair are, are a particular concern, how this would be, uh, how, people, how people would deal with an animal that was in a, in a residence that became problematic to someone's opinion. Uh, who, who's going to enforce that? Um, I just think that in general, this is not something that a municipality through town meeting uh, is appropriately going to address. Mr. Diggins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so a quick yes or no to uh, Mr. Schlickman. Um, snakes? Uh, I don't believe snakes were listed is a uh, common household pet. So, okay. if, if, so if the learned selects person would like snakes included in it, I would certainly uh, not mind because most people who own snakes really are very vigilant about keeping them within their units. Yeah. Fine, fine, just trying to understand the range. I mean, thank you. Mm -hmm. you know, so you exclude two families, you know, so, so um, and, and what's the basis for the exclusion? Uh, owner occupied. Uh, right. I, I've communicated with. W when this came about, what happened was I've received a couple of correspondences from uh, people who are owners of two family uh, homes, uh, with their preference for not having a uh, an animal within their domain, and in terms of coming up with a compromise that would uh, move beyond. Uh, the owners of a two-family unit who are renting out essentially part of their building, uh, I thought it best to classify them in the same place where we're putting ADUs and roommate situations. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, given that apparently so many people, so many renters, meet, um, own pets, 75%, meet, um, why, why do you think the market hasn't solved this problem on its own? Because it seems like, I mean, I mean, if you have a lot of people renting they have pets, I mean, a person, you know, with a building, you know, that's renting, he would do well, I mean, to, to um, allow, I mean, um, in pet owners, I mean, it seems like they're depriving themselves of potential renters. That is very true, except there's one other confounding factor, which is yeah. the, uh, the housing crisis we have here. In places where you're building a lot of new units where they're looking to attract people in, it is not uncommon for the same developer to install a dog park in those units and have a prohibition on pets in, in other areas that are that, where the housing market leans more towards the uh, seller or the landlord. Hmm. So, in, 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 
Yeah, in other words, what, what's going on here is that the housing market is so competitive is that landlords uh, can just add on restrictions without any real financial penalty because there's such a, a, a wait list of people looking for housing. But it seems to me that you would be able to make, okay, never mind. You know, so. Um, Mr. So, Diggins, uh, may I yes. respond to that? Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, times change and ideas change. And when, when I was a baby, um, there, it was possible to uh, restrict couples from having babies in, in, their, in their apartments. And my parents actually had to move because of me from their apartment in Plainfield, uh, New Jersey. And that changed because people understood that was wrong and it wasn't in the public interest. I think times have changed now where people are starting to realize that people who are renting are really not in, the, in a position of power and they need assistance. And mm -hmm. I, I myself have suffered that. To have to move after 20 years in an apartment that I loved because of the no dog policy that came to be, that, that was very difficult for me. And, but I didn't have any power to change that. The condominium association through my landlord gave me a notice that I had to go. That was it. I, wasn't, I didn't have any power. Thank you. I, I think I have all the answers to the questions I have. I appreciate that. Thank you. Attorney Cunningham. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you know, Mr. Chair. And I, I certainly am sympathetic to those who feel they're without power to make change. And I think that some of these changes that are, the proponents are seeking, uh, perhaps they have some ability to, to enact those changes, but it's just not through town meeting. Uh, it's through state or federal legislators uh, working to enact laws that change what people can and can't do and pre to prevent discrimination. Um, it's, it's not just simply not something that should be, in my opinion, before town meeting. Thank you very much. Mr. DeCourse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple more questions, too. Just get at the, the state of the law in Massachusetts mm -hmm. right now in terms of reasonable accommodations. Like right now, a service animal or emotional support animal, um, a tenant or a landlord would be, uh, would have to make a reasonable co accommodation for that situation, correct? I can again speak from life experience mm -hmm. on that, I'm afraid. Um, I was run over by a train when I was 26 years old and I had a dog. And my lawyer was able to go to court and argue that I was disabled, which I was, and that my dog was an emotional support dog. Um, so I was able to rely on the fact that I had a disability. So yes, that can be very effective. You need a lawyer and you need to go through the process, but yes. Okay, I'm on the, the Mass Office of, on Disability webpage right now, and it, it, it discusses both emotional support animals and service animals meet the definition of an assistance animal under the Fair Housing Act, and that's that we're talking about with reasonable accommodation. So that, I just want to try to just get at some agreement. There's agreement that, that those reasonable accommodations would apply if, if that pet meets the, either one of those definitions as a service animal or emotional support animal. I'm asking a question if you're in agreement with that. Certainly a person with okay. disabilities right. has, and, and, has an exception to build mm -hmm. on, yes. Okay, and, and, I, and, I think in, and I think we're all sympathetic. I mean, we, we appreciate the analysis done by Attorney Cunningham and, and, and Attorney Munson. I will say on, on the case, and you didn't have much opportunity to look at it given, you, given that you just saw it this morning, but that Noble v. Murphy case, you're, you're absolutely right, the dogs and the, one of the owners were killed in an accident, and actually the, the, the remaining tenant was evicted before the oral argument, but they still went through and the case went to decision. But that dealt with, you mentioned the condominium only being able to, to regulate common areas, and it, that dealt with Chapter 183A, Section 11, which allows a condominium association to enact bylaws respecting the use and maintenance of units. And that, that's what was at issue there, is the use of the particular unit, not the condominium. And, it, and I'm not aware of any amendments to that statute. So I think the concern that Attorney Cunningham raises about state law perhaps preempting it, certainly with respect to the condominium situation, I think given the fact that this was just fresh in terms of you coming back to us, and, and it's hard for Attorney Cunningham to respond on the fly to, to your comments, um, 
you know, maybe it needs a little bit more analysis, but I, I looking at that case, because I, I read the case after they, um, it was cited to us, that still seems to apply. And I, I wonder, Mr. Schlickman, if your condominium association has a bylaw, I, 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 I know you have a cat, but I guess it mm -hmm. doesn't, but I mean, some do, and mm -hmm. it seems like it's perfectly permissible, mm -hmm. because if a majority of the condominium owners, um, whether it's two thirds or 50%, want to amend their bylaws, they're certainly free to do it under Chapter 183A, but I have a concern about us doing something here at the local level, given that statute with condominiums, given the Fair, given the Fair Housing Act, and given what's already out there. And, and again, I may not be ready to take a final vote on this tonight, but I'm, I'm um, while sympathetic, I have concerns about doing this before town meeting. You know, I, I hear your argument, and I, we've got two attorneys in the room with two different viewpoints. If I got brought in five more attorneys, we'd have seven viewpoints in this room. And none of them matter except for the attorney general. It is the attorney general's review and ruling that counts. The town of Brookline enacted a local law that prohibited the sale of tobacco to anyone born after January 1, 2000. Very controversial, and it was very questionable whether or not the town of Brookline had the authority to do that. But they passed it and it went through the normal review process. It went through the Attorney General and it ended up in the courts, but it has now set a precedent that towns are allowed to pass that sort of bylaw. We are in a position now where we, ha we are the first. We are the first town to go and propose this. I have no idea what the Attorney General is going to say. There's a severability clause into, in this proposed bylaw. I would welcome an opportunity to work with counsel to craft this in such a way that things that he thinks are more difficult would be easily severed if the Attorney General wanted to take parts of it out. If the Attorney General decided that this was not appropriate for a town to do, we can then take that decision back to our legislators. But to kill this potential bylaw at this point, before it goes to town meeting, before it goes to the attorney general, before the, the public has a right to examine this and to think about it, uh, really deprives us and the other 350 municipalities in the Commonwealth of the opportunity to be guided by the attorney general's review and analysis of, of this bylaw. And thank you for your comments. Okay, uh, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, I mean, I have comments, and they're actually unrelated to the legality of it. I think we should get to that mm -hmm. at some point, but you know, I, you know, we'll do that post um, public comment, like mm -hmm. we usually do. I would disagree that. It, I mean, we put a lot of weight in mm -hmm. ta Attorney General mm -hmm. and Attorney Cunningham's analysis, so to say his analysis doesn't matter mm -hmm. is incorrect. And there's many bylaws that we've dealt with mm -hmm. where we've gotten from either Attorney Cunningham or Attorney Heim, we've got analysis of whether or not mm -hmm. the bylaw would be passed by mm -hmm. the Attorney General's office. And we rely on that and it helps us craft how we vote on a bylaw and it helps town meeting decide whether or not they're gonna pass a bylaw or when they're gonna spend the time on it. So. We certainly do put a lot of stock in the analysis that we get from our town council. May, may I just um, clarify that point? <laughs> Comment. It's not okay. a, it's not a response. question. Okay. No. Uh, proceed, Mr. Hurd. Yep. So I, with that, I would say let's, I mean, you know, it's not my meeting to have here, but I would look, mm -hmm. like to move to public comment, and then we can kind of have our wrap-up comments from there. Mm -hmm. Ms. Mahan, do you have anything before we go to public comment? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, I just want to be a stickler and say uh, we have... Attorney Cunningham is our town council, and we have Attorney Munson as our deputy town council. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really important. And just as I wouldn't say to Mr. Schlickman, uh, when you're a colleague over on the school committee, um, the attorney that gives you uh, advice, whether it's labor negotiations, excuse me. Uh, I, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. You have, seem to have a propensity to do that. So besides overlooking our new female deputy town council, please don't interrupt. Um, 
and now my temper is getting the best of me. It, but I will note that it, in the beginning when you were uh, giving your presentation, Mr. Schlickman, uh, with all due respect, you did say that this is something that you were trying out. Uh, you weren't sure if it was town meeting. You weren't sure whether to go to the state or the federal route. And you're basically, I guess, you know, starting here and you, you even admit it may not be the appropriate place to go. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the discussion we're having here mm -hmm. tonight without besmirging our two town councils. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Mr. Diggins, do you have any, I think you were you okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move to the public hearing portion of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll thank the, and ask the proponents to, um, to go ahead and take their seats in case uh, members of the public want to come up and make further comment. Thank May I have a point us. of personal privilege? This isn't town meeting. I know. Um, Make it brief, Mr. Slickman. I'm not looking to besmirch anything. I mean, as one school committee member, I am worthless unless I get three others to agree with me. All I'm saying is the definitive uh, opinion, the one that counts at, at the supreme level is, is the uh, Attorney General's office. Anything that, our opinions matter. Uh, we use the school department, gains a lot of very good advice from town council. We, we treasure that. All I'm saying is that the one who can rule on this definitively, whether or not is a valid bylaw or not, is not us, not anybody in this room, not any other attorney, town attorney, uh, town council, anywhere in the Commonwealth. The only uh, attorneys who have the determinative factor in saying definitely this is legal, this is not, is the attorney general's law. That's all I'm saying. Understood. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Thank Mr. You. Chair, I'd like to add, uh, I, have a, we, we, I have a different we, does, this, does this add to the, I, I think at this point, I think we've, we've had a really robust discussion. I want to turn to public comment. Um, if we have questions, we'll, we'll let you call you later. Thank you very much. Um, so let's go to public comment at this point. Uh, if you are in Zoom uh, and wish to comment on this article, there was a question in the Q&A on that. Please make sure that your hand is raised in Zoom, and of course we have ra hands raised in the room. Let's start in the room with Mr. Benson. Please introduce yourself, and uh, three minutes please for all comments. Thank you, uh, Eugene Benson, town meeting member, precinct 10. Um, one thing I would ask the board and the proponents to consider if they're going to go ahead is that this exempts two family homes in which the owner lives in one of the two, but we also have a number of three-family homes in Arlington that might have owners in one. And the MBTA Communities Act that we passed last year will probably result in more three-family homes getting built. So I would suggest and ask the proponents to consider expanding the exemption so it goes up to three-family homes that are also owner-occupied. Second point, I want to make, I just read the um, proposal, is that it does include snakes. It does not exclude snakes, because what it actually says, animal companion <coughs> means an animal of the kind usually kept as a pet who resides and sleeps indoors. And it says such as, but not limited to, it doesn't use the word limit to, it says such as dog, cat, rabbit, bird, fish, hamster, gerbil, or other animal that typically resides and sleeps indoors. So that would include a snake. And I don't know whether you have experience with snakes, but they go very strange places, and they don't stay necessarily mm -hmm. in the apartment where they are. So I think the proponents should think about refining the definition so that it's more specific about what it's going to do. Um, the third quick point I'll make, and for this I'm thinking back to the years when I taught planning and land use law, is condominium documents are basically contracts. And I just am concerned, I ask town council to think about this, whether this board can, can require condo associations to change what is in a legal contract. You know, the places where government does that is when they rely on fair housing, disability law, things like that, where it's very specific that it gives them the authority to do that. I'm not sure, absent that, that you could do that. You could probably prevent, I would guess, 
subject to what Mr. DeCourcy mentioned, new condo documents, but I'm not sure you can require current condo documents to be amended because you would be um, interfering with the sanctity of contract. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's now turn to Zoom and let's bring in uh, Judith Garber. Say that uh, we're, we're, we're turning to a Zoom participant now. No, I now. just wanted to say something. Yeah, but so we'll get to it. I'll note that your hand oh, is raised, okay. and we'll call on you when, uh, when uh, it's time for someone in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good, good evening, Ms. Garber. Zoom you can enable your camera if you wish. <laughs> I'm good to just be voice. Um, sure, that's thank fine. you so much, yeah. Judith Garber, Precinct 4, Massachusetts Ave. Um, I, I don't have anything to say on the legal side of this, but I did want to present um, a story from a friend in Arlington. When I told them about this proposed um, bylaw change, um, he said, oh, wow, that would have made it so that I could actually keep my dog because he had um, he and his longtime partner had recently split up. And because he had just moved to Arlington into um, a place that didn't allow pets, he could no longer share custody of his dog and now only gets to see him, you know, maybe a couple of days a month or one day a month, uh, which has been really devastating. So, um, and I know many other stories of that, of that nature. So I, I think this would have a really positive impact on a lot of the folks I know uh, who rent in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's now turn back to the room. I think um, oh, Ms. Robinson had her hand raised earlier. <laughs> And uh, come to the table, please. Introduce yourself and your place of residence and three minutes comment. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be very, very long at all. My name's Joanne Robinson. And, you know, I think that um, having pets is a really important thing to people. And those things, I think, are, are critical. But I don't feel like, um, you know, people who have a lot of dogs, I don't know what number of dogs would be in houses and those kinds of things I think have to be worried out because I've when we moved into our house there were about seven or eight cats in the house itself and it was just uh, you know bad and I feel like you have to have some barriers or some some thought about those kinds of things. That's it. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, let's go back to Zoom. We'll ro uh, alternate back and forth. Uh, we have Laura Kiesel. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> for comment on Article 17. Good evening, new, uh, good evening again, Ms. Kiesel. And you should be able to unmute yourself at this time. Sorry, so Laura Kiesel, Precinct 6. I just had a couple of points that I wanted to speak on. Again, I can't, I'm not a lawyer, I can't speak to the legal aspect, but I can say that, well, one, when I was working on Article 16 with the pet sales, a lot of those rescue organizations that endorsed our warrant were also interested in supporting this as well because they're getting, getting inundated with animals, and the number one reason is because there's such a lack of pet friendly housing as as rentals are taking over and more people are struggling to find rental housing and particular affordable housing with the lack of that they're the ones getting a lot of these animals and unfortunately when they can't they're getting euthanized so that was a and you may have already gotten letters to that effect from some of those rescue organizations um b as a renter i just wanted to share a couple quick stories to this is when I tried to get into affordable housing here in Arlington in 2011 and my name came up on the wait list after a year for the Housing Corporation of Arlington at the time they had a no pet policy so they told me quote get rid of your cats and you can come to affordable housing and you know at the time three out of four of my immediate family members had just died I was leaving a 10-year relationship I was not going to get rid of my cats, which were my family. And so I had to give up that space. And I really had to struggle for a year 
uh, to find any housing. And it took several more years for me to come back up on the waiting list. And luckily by then, uh, the Housing Corporation of Arlington had changed because there was such a problem with so many low income people not being able to access that housing because of pets or having to be ripped apart from their pets. And the affordable housing, both with HCA and AHA, now have pet policies that I think could offer pretty good precedents that the town could have with reasonable limits. Uh, the third thing I want to say is when I went back on the rental market after leaving affordable housing in 2021, by that time, my pets were no longer pets, but emotional support animals. So I had that supposed protection under fair housing, state and federal fair housing laws. But in my experience, it took me months because most of the landlords and brokers, like seven or eight out of every 10 I was seeing, were leveraging the no pet policies to deny me housing. And people could say, well, you have a legal right. But at the time, you don't really have any recourse. You know, you could take them to court, which you can't take everyone when you're looking for housing. And it would take months, if not years, for an outcome. And at the time, I needed housing. So there's a lot of limitations on that right, even for disabled people with service animals. And I know it's not just me. I witnessed it regularly on the Facebook page for Arlington Rentals of brokers and landlords denying people their service animals under the auspices of no pet policies. Those, so those do get exploited heavily and there's very little recourse. Um, and, and that's not just anecdotal. The Suffolk County, I mean, Suffolk University study for discrimination experienced by Section 8 voucher holders in the Boston metro area um, they found that the denial of service animals and assistance animals for Section 8 voucher holders trying to get a rental was one of the leading forms of discrimination that we face and that there's very little recourse for us. So I just wanted to offer that because I know we're talking a lot about the fair housing law. So unfortunately, without more pet friendly policies, a lot of disabled people will also suffer lack of housing um, for their service and assistance animals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we had, uh, let's go to the room, and uh, I believe Ms. Stamps had her hand up earlier. Good evening. Please introduce yourself in three minutes, Thank you. Uh, Susan Stamps, town meeting member, Precinct 3. Um, I just want to make two quick points that I thought of while during the discussion. I have a great deal of respect for uh, town council, and, um, and I don't know about the legalities, but here are two things that I do know. One is that I remember the days when as one of the proponents uh, recalled, where uh, landlords could refuse to rent to people with children. Um, and are pets the new children? I, I'm thinking maybe they are. The other thing I'm thinking about is this is also about housing equity. Um, I own my own condo. If, if, if I want to rent to somebody, that's my decision. If I want to, if I want to have three cats, which I happen to, um, I can do that. Nobody can tell me what to do. Um, but people, as Ms. Kiesel was just saying, when people are renters, they don't have that power. And um, animals really are family. And so I would, I, I understand there may be legal complexities, which town meeting really can't surmount. Um, but I do tend to lean towards uh, Mr. Schlickman's attitude, which is let's pass it and see what happens when it goes to the Attorney General's office. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tostig, come to the table, please. Did you want to come in on this article? Yes. Oh, come on up to the table, yes, thank you. Introduce yourself, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Al Tosti. I live up at uh, Watermill Place, condominiums. Uh, for 43 years, I lived in East Arlington, had my own house, raised my kids, etc. And then uh, we finally got tired of shoveling snow and such. So we started looking for a condo. And I had two, requ two requirements. Uh, one is that uh, uh, they had uh, no pets. And the other was no smoking. I'm an asthmatic. I am deathly allergic to cats, dogs any of those, uh, and also cigarette smoke. And we looked for about three years, and then finally we decided on Watermill Place because they have no pets and a, uh, no smoking. Can't even smoke in your own unit. Uh, I think uh, I'm here to speak against this. Um, I am a board member of the uh, board of directors of Watermill Place, uh, but I'm just speaking for myself, not for the board. Uh, I think that 
Uh, you know, cities and towns hate for the state to come in and tell them what to do. Well, each condominium association is its own community. And they set their, they set their rules. All these regulations have to be passed by like two thirds or three quarters, depending on the condo docs uh, of their own unit. And my condominium chose no smoking, no pets. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, if you have a uh, service animal, that's always an exception. Uh, if you have a uh, comfort animal, even though I think it's grossly abused, uh, they also have exceptions to that. Uh, we have some people who are people who own pets prior to the implementation of this rule. They were grandfathered in. So we've got five or six cats uh, in the area. But having pets has, very, has several very identifiable problems. One uh, is people who are allergic to cats and dogs, and they're uh, in all the common areas uh, you come in con can come in contact with that. It's a, it's a health problem and it's a uh, um, cleanliness problem. Uh, we, we have our condo, all our common areas uh, vacuumed twice, uh, twice a week. Uh, they're shampooed twice a year. Uh, and yet when we go into some condominiums that allow for pets, the hallways stink uh, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, so I think that um, please vote against this. Um, I'm not even sure of the legalities. Uh, condominium regulations are set by state law, so I don't know how that would have impact this. But I think my basic thing is let each condominium trust set up their own rules and regulations. Uh, we, com we comply with all state laws and federal laws, uh, but a community should have a right to choose its own values and its own a uh, sense of uh, what's important for that community. And I don't think the town should, could step in and try to overrule that. So that's my thought, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Do we have other members of the public in Zoom or in the room who wish to comment on this article? Seeing Ms. Mark? no hands raised. Uh, Mr. Teal. <clears throat> I hope I finally learned to pronounce your last name correctly. <laughs> How, how'd I do? Perfect. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. And just introduce yourself uh, once again for people uh, tuning in late. Uh, actually, I have handouts. Oh. And give this to Ms. Mar. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, three minutes, please. <clears throat> Carrie Teal, 11A Lakeview Street. You know, I, I just want to start by thanking Mr. Cunningham and Ms. Munson uh, for the work on all of these warrant articles. They did a fantastic job. I'm very grateful for their work. So I just want to make that very clear at the outset. Um, I think there may be a genuine difference of opinion uh, on this particular one. Um, and that's why I'm hoping that there will be further work done and further discussion in the coming weeks to try and refine this. Um, if condos need to be exempted, both legally or as a policy or political matter, that should happen. Uh, if, you know, as far as the discriminatory language goes, discrimination language, my understanding is that is simply intent language that could be removed and had zero impact uh, on the warrant article itself. I, I don't think that's a critical piece of this. Uh, now I, I know that we want clear precedence when we pass things. That's not only legally, but also from a policy perspective, you, no one wants to be first. Um, this is a forward-looking <coughs> warrant article. I, I would say it is much more impactful than the other two you passed tonight. Just to be clear, I support all three, but this is a warrant article that will directly help animals, a large number of animals. It'll directly help people, it'll dire directly help tenants. This is a very impactful warrant article. And for that reason, we should continue to work on it and solve these issues and find a way forward. Um, however, there are precedents. In fact, last year, the United Kingdom nationally passed essentially a version of what is before you today. Uh, in California, even though the law that's on the books already only applies to state housing, again, it is very similar, nearly identical to what you're looking at today. The bill that was just filed, which would be all housing in California, is virtually identical to what you're looking at today. Uh, I spoke with uh, an aide who's handling this issue for the California bill sponsor, Assemblymember Matt ha Haney's office today. They were surprised um, 
uh, when hearing the concerns raised around the legality of this because they are currently negotiating this issue with stakeholders. And obviously state law, California does not apply to, to Massachusetts, but in terms of the federal piece, I was told by their office no argument has been made in California, either in terms of the current law that's already on the books or this new bill that's somehow a violation of federal law. That just has not been made in California, even by the bill opponents. So um, I, I would urge you to take that into consideration. You know, I said earlier tonight that Arlington has led on this issue. And we could easily have not gone forward with the rodenticide issue and said, their concerns that this may not pass review by the Attorney General. We did not do that. We went forward with that article. In fact, parts of that article were in fact invalidated. And yet, we had a profound impact. We, we, we led the state on this issue. And so I would say, you know, give us a chance to figure this out, to get the legal piece right, to get the policy piece right. I, I humbly offer myself, I know Mr. Schlickman and, and Ms. Dorchek would as well, uh, to work with town council and any other stakeholders that, that want to try and get this right. Uh, you know, give us a chance to do that and, and come back to you. Because at the end of the day, I hope to earn your support on this in some form. Thank you, Mr. Till. OK, any other members of the public wish to comment on this article? Anything in, in anybody in Zoom? No. Um, okay, so let's conclude the public hearing and now uh, we'll turn uh, to the board for discussion and motions. And Attorney Cunningham, did you have anything before we do that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wanting to thank you to Mrs. Mahan for noting the presence of Deputy Town Council, our new Deputy Town Council. Deputy Town Council uh, did a significant amount of work on this Warren article and its analysis. I was wondering with the discretion of the chair if we'd allow uh, Attorney Munson to present some, some response to the public comment or I'd very, Yeah, I'd be very happy to. I think that, that would be informative for the board for our, our, our uh, impending debate. Welcome, Attorney Munson. And, uh, Hi, welcome thank you, Mr. Again Chair. To Arlington. Yeah. Um, so just to respond to a couple of the comments, I think, you know, even in circumstances where there is unsettled law that doesn't create an affirmative right, and like town council said, federal law really does govern here. Um, the Federal Housing Act actually applies pretty broadly to public and private housing. Um, the definition of assistance animals within that policy and that law actually excludes pets, which is telling and it's instructive that it was not meant for um, you know, pets and assistance animals to kind of be grouped together. Um, obviously, violations of the Federal Housing Act at any level can't really be cured at a state level. Um, people would need to initiate some sort of private right to action of that. And I also think that the interference in private contracts would be a concern. Um, that's a constitutional um, pr uh, principle as well, freedom of contract. Um, so being able to dictate at a local level what private contracts could do, um, you know, that could also increase liability on the town's end. Um, so just a couple of things to consider and I can answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Attorney Munson. Any questions for Attorney Munson from the board while she's uh, at the table? Okay, we know where to yes. find you. So. Uh, Mr. Diggins, please. Yes, sure. You can, um, please, Attorney Munson, um, can you explain the liability on the town's end part, please? Sure. I just. So this is this would be assuming that you know. Um, well, I mean, obviously, this has to go to the attorney general. Um, but if for some reason, and this is just like pretending that the attorney general's opinion would not necessarily be necessary here, interfering in private contracts. Um, generally at a government level. Um, municipalities have been sued for that before, including in Massachusetts, including um, certain municipalities around Arlington. So it's just something to consider when a gov local government is looking to kind of engage in private contracts. Um, and like we've stated, the federal law really does govern here. It's very instructive. Um, and so if people have you know concerns and um, there are violations of the Federal Housing Act. That's something that they may need to initiate at a private level. Um, and so I think the you know, overarching legal concerns here is that there is no um, constitutional right to pet ownership. What this bylaw amendment is basically asking is to um, create a new protected class, which would be pet ownership. And that's not something that we can unfortunately do at a local level. So the, the, the breadth of the amendment is um, what's concerning. Thanks. That was very really helpful. Mr. Chair, can I ask Attorney Munson another question? Please do. Yeah. I mean, so I take it then if we pass this bylaw, it would not be legal for any entity to um, say 
he no pets, right? You know, so so I mean, let's say let's say we we have a case like like Mr. Tossi. You, know, you have people who are like me. I just I mean, for health reasons, I, mean, I can't live in a place that has um, pets. You know, uh, let's say a three family or 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 yeah. So so I could go on, but you, I think you get my point. Would it be illegal to create such a um, complex? So I think what we do with our research is we look for like we look for things and we collect all of the evidence that we can find and we create the the best prediction of what the outcome will be. And so our best prediction in this case is that it likely would not pass muster for the attorney general's office, probably for all of the and including some of the reasons that you might have stated. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. And thank you for standing by as always. Uh, thank you, Attorney Cunningham. Mr. Hurd. Thanks. <laughs> this is a long one. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get into the legalities of it. That's, I think we could sit here for hours and talk about that. I just, from where I sit, and hopefully a couple votes earlier tonight, in the fact that I'm the owner of a wonderful dog that we love and couldn't live without, um, will establish that I'm a lover of animals, but I think this, I'm just not at a point just from a policy perspective where I'm ready to tell someone that owns a two-family in any Starlington, even if they don't live there. I mean, I think there's reasons why someone might want to say no pets, i.e. feuding tenants where, you know, landlords could have, because of other protections, it, in at state law have issues with you know if it, if there's a, a a conflict that comes up between two tenants you can't just evict one or the other and it could put you in a in a in a rough position in that and i think there are i, I think mr diggins had mentioned that you know there is a market for units that allow pets and i think that will helped to you know regulate and and promote pet ownership among landlords but i'm just not in a, in a place right now where i'm going to require a, a landlord of, at, at any level to rent to allow pets in the units and i think mr tosti's comments were insightful in that it gave a couple of examples but I'm sure there's other examples if we ha if we ask other individuals um, why they'd like to live or rent their properties without without allowing pets to be in them. So for those reasons, and same thing with condos, I think you know there could be rationales that as to that we haven't even talked about today, tonight as to why a condominium might have a no pet policy, whether it's a large condominium or two units on Marathon Street. Um, so I think, again, just for me, I'm not in a place where I think it's good policy even to test the waters because at first you get, you got to make sure you want to pass the bylaw before you send it to the Attorney General's to see if it will pass muster because if it does, then you have the bylaw. So um, that's just where I am. I'm not inclined to support this. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Other members of the board? Was there a motion there or just at this point? I, you don't have to. I, I'll move. Your, your, um, I'll, I'll make, go, go ahead. I'll make a motion for no action. Second. I, I was going to listen for. Second. Yeah, 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 it's fine. I didn't mean to coerce you yeah. into, uh, into that, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Mahad. Oh, I was. Yeah. Oh, you were, you were going to. So okay. I, I will now say. We have a second by Mrs. Mahad. Okay. Did you have discussion on this at this point? Just briefly, and I, I won't go into it, but there are other, um, I think there needs to be a lot more work done on this. Um, if there are other cases of um, different classes, protected people, um, that this needs to be taken into consideration and also put in there. And I just think this select board, um, because it's now in our backyard to vote on, is, is not the... Uh, uh, most efficient or legal way to uh, redress this. Thank you. Mr. Dickens. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, this is a tough one. And it definitely leads to not a lot more work. And, uh, and I, and I, and it isn't so much to equate, equate being pets with children, you know, but it, I, I do see it, 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 it can be hard for people who need something, you know, um, to do without it. I mean, and then to have me in a situation where you, you also need housing in, and you can't get it because of the other need that you have me then, and you're torn between them. I totally understand uh, where people are coming from on this. And I understand that you know, there are laws, but as um, Ms. Kiesel pointed out, it's like, well, the litigation takes time. I mean, and when you need housing, you, you, you don't have the time. You don't have the, the luxury of, of, of taking someone to court. And if you don't have a whole lot of money, you don't even have I mean, really good um, access to do that. I mean, interestingly, I would have an easier time with this I mean, if it also uh, made I mean, um, two families I mean, um, um, abide by you know, the intent of the, the bylaw, because it's like, if it's if you shouldn't have be uh, a bias and trying not to use the D word because I understand the implications of that, then it should apply me to to everyone. And, uh, but what's going to happen here is that we're going to get a substitute motion. This is going to town meeting. And, uh, and I think what the board needs to do is explain you know why it is me that we are taking the position we have and 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 then give town meeting some really good. Advice. I, mean, uh, uh, I, um, I, I, I certainly understand the the legal argument that town council is making. You know, um, I think I think it carries the day. You know, I mean, in the end, I mean, even though I understand the proponents, I mean, uh, and then I think I'm going to probably go no action on this. I mean, uh, but I also feel that we really need to write a good commentary on this one uh, to help town meeting on it. Because as I said, it's, it's just going to be a substitute motion. It's going before them. We just want to give them some advice. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'll just, I'll just say in, re in regard to Mr. Diggins' uh, comment, I think part of the value of this process with the select board is to allow a public hearing, to hear comments from different sides, to help us think of dimensions of the issue that we haven't thought of so that we can give, this is ultimately advice to town meeting. We can give, we can give town meeting informed advice um, and help town meeting think through the different facets of the problem. So I, you know, I really uh, echo Mr. Diggins' um, remarks in that regard. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I'm going to support Mr. Hurd's motion, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this hearing has allowed different viewpoints to come out, and, and yeah, it's going to be up to us to, to have a solid comment, and I'm confident that we will. And I, I, I really thank Attorney Munson for the, bringing out the, the freedom of contract issues, because that clearly... Um, with respect to condom condominium associations, that's clearly at the forefront, um, and, and there is a, a definite potential conflict with condominium law uh, as to the use of a particular unit. There's other things in here that might run afoul of the security deposit law um, in terms of the pet fee. That's, that's minor. That's way down the list. But I, I think you know there, there'll be some more work done. We now have, I'd mentioned AB 2216, and a handout appeared with it on it, and, and there are differences there in terms of um, talking about reasonable justifications in that proposed legislation, that there are no justifications in the bylaw here. It, it, you know, there are exceptions for two units or less, but it's, 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 it's an outright um, uh, prohibition against the, the landlords not allowing pets, whereas the California proposed bill, which again we, we don't have to rely on California law, but um, it, it it will be helpful with the comments. And and I think there was a, a, a comment earlier about violating federal law. Well, there's a, there's an issue with state law too, and and so it's both state and federal law. And, and Mr. Deal brought up the, the rodenticide issue a few years ago, and we parsed that out. Remember when we had that discussion here at the select board? There were pieces of what was being proposed that clearly conflicted with state law. There were preemption issues. And, and Mr. Helmuth actually brought a motion to parse that out, and the board went along with it, and we got through town meeting. That's the type of discussion that comes here. Comes here. So I, I rely on council to, to, to help us out. And if everything, if it was just everything going to the attorney general, then there's no sense in having us vote at all. Every idea we'll just hand over. I think we have to do our job to take a look 
at, um, with the assistance of council where we think this may go and what's in the best interest of town. And, and again, this has nothing to do with um, the difficulties tenants may have in, in, in finding apartments. And Noble v. Murphy, the case that cited, the court specifically pointed that out, that you don't have to sympathize with the condominium association to acknowledge that they do have the right by contract through their bylaws to say that this is how, uh, this is the type of uses we want our unit. So I'm confident there'll be a solid um, comment if, if that's the way the vote goes. And I think there's more work to be done on that, but I think we'll have a sense of the board uh, after this evening. Thank you very much. Um, just briefly for my comments, um, I will also support the motion. Um, I am, um, I'm glad for the discussion. I appreciate the problem this is trying to solve. Um, I'm sympathetic to it. And I think that particularly the comments regarding um, the way that this intersects with the need for people to find housing um, are really moving to me, and, and also the, the effect that this has on, on animals and animals being abandoned. Um, so there's clear problems there, and I think that this is a case of balancing that w without respect to the legal, the legal issues, which I think do need, clearly need to me, need a lot more work um, and a lot more analysis. But we're you know, balancing the, the needs and the rights of neighbors, property owners, condominium associations. It's, you know, it, it's, it's complicated. I don't have enough tonight for me to, su to support moving forward. Um, I have a lot of confidence that this will nevertheless be a robust discussion at town meeting should the proponents or others um, decide to bring it there. So any other, before we vote, any other last comments uh, from my colleagues? Okay, so I have a motion for recommended no action by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Thanks to all who participated. This brings us now to Article 18, a bylaw amendment for historic building demolition delay. This is an amendment that I believe would uh, seek to uh, change the current demolition delay from one year to two years. And we have uh, Ms. Robinson here to present Hello. your bylaw. Welcome. Please introduce yourself again. Yes, my name is Joanne Robinson. I'm the chair of the uh, Historical Commission. Um, and uh, in, 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 uh, thank you very much. Can you just clarify, was this by law um, brought by the Historical Commission or by 10 registered voters? Did, did the Historic Commission, uh, Historical Commission sponsor this by law? We voted on okay. taking that and, and the, uh, I think the districts also agreed Okay, with that. good, thank so, you very much. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, please, please continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm, uh, the, I'm just going to read this and um, I don't have any pretty pictures, so I'm sorry. Um, the town's demolition delay bylaw uh, was first passed in 1970 and the wording was um, for the purposes of preserving and protecting through advance notice of their proposed <coughs> demolition significant buildings within the town which constitute or reflect distinctive features of the architectural, cultural, political, economic, or social history of the town to encourage owners to preferably preserve significant buildings to seek out persons who might be willing to purchase and preserve, rehabilitate, or restore such buildings rather than doing the demolition. And I just wanted to set that up. Um, for the most part of the last century, since the law was passed, it has worked very well to help preserve and protect the town's important historic buildings by allowing the Historical Commission to impose a one-year delay on demolition, giving the commission time to work closely with homeowner or a developer uh, to find ways to preserve the building rather than to demolish it. Many significant local buildings have been saved from the wrecking ball uh, thanks to the demolition delay, but Arlington has changed um, enormously in the past 54 years, especially noticeable in the steep increase in home property values and the increased numbers of historic buildings that come before us. 
Um, one result is that developers in particular have targeted residential buildings that have been <clears throat> deemed historically significant as highly profitable projects to be demolished and replaced with multifamily structures or large single family homes that can sell for millions. In these cases, the developers will apply for a demolition permit and then come before the Historical Commission for permission to demolish the building. In most cases, we declare that such a building um, is prefer preferentially preserved, but it triggers only a one-year uh, delay before the property owner can carry out demolition. We then spend time to work with the property owners or try to find alternatives to demolition. Over 50 years, we have often succeeded, but in many other cases, the clock has run out before we can find a solution, and the building is raised, and it goes, and it goes part of the way of um, Arlington's history and their buildings. In order to fulfill our mission of protecting and preserving the historic fabric of the town, the Historical Commission is seeking to extend the current one-year demolition delay to two years. Um, extending the demolition delay to two years is not, and I repeat, it is not a measure aimed at penalizing individual homeowners. Instead, it is a recognition that while the one-year demolition delay had worked well in the past to allow the commission time to work with the property owners to find alternatives to demolition, uh, now the dramatic increase in property values um, has uh, led to more property owners, including developers who are willing to buy historic properties and simply factor in the one year uh, delay as a part of the cost of doing business. When the original bylaw was passed in 1970, Arlington was in the forefront of Massachusetts communities with demolition delay bylaws. Now we're lagging behind in our effectiveness and that can be remedied simply by extending the period of time that we can work with homeowners and developers on ways to preserve and restore buildings instead of knocking them down. Other towns, including Lexington, Watertown, and Milton have recently extended their demolition delay periods, and there are 17 communities in all in the Massachusetts that have demolition delays over 12 months. Not every building can be saved. We have approved demolition of historic structures in cases where the building is too far gone and or presents a risk to health and safety. But far, often, far more often, we have succeeded in saving buildings by working closely, sometimes over long periods of times, with homeowners and developers to help find solutions that serve the property owner's needs and at the same time preserve a part of Arlington's historic legacy. Uh, we have tried all along to help homeowners secure low interest preservation loans from funds and um, that are earmarked especially for historic restoration. Uh, we regularly keep a case open for many years, uh, many months, and assign a monitor from the commission to be in close contact with property owners all through the renovation project. And we help guide people to historic sources and materials that are appropriate for their projects and give advice as needed throughout the process. In our experience, it's relatively 
rare that we are forced to impose a demo, you know, a, a demo, demolition delay on a project proposed by an individual homeowner. In most cases, homeowners are willing to work with us and often appreciate our help. Again, the change from a one-year delay to two years is not meant in any way to penalize homeowners and is simply a recognition that in today's economic climate, one year is not enough time to find solutions that will allow us to fulfill our mission as mandated by the bylaw and to preserve and protect Arlington's historic structures. That's my two cents. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. If you could just stay here for a couple of questions. Um, yeah. for, thank you for your service on the, on the commission. Um, can you, I just want to clarify the source of the bylaw just, just for the public record. So according to our records, this was filed by you and 10 registered voters. It was requested by you and, and not specifically by the commission. Um, am I under, understand that the commission has taken a vote of support of this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Very well. And can you, uh, you briefly touched on this and I uh, was trying to take some notes. You mentioned that there were 17 communities that have delays of longer than 12 months. Is that right? Are, they have, um, you know, uh, demo delays yep. that are over 12 months. And do you know how many of them go up to two years? Um, yes, I think that um, I'm not quite sure of all of that. I have a couple of, you know, I do have some uh, pictures and uh, I called the uh, Mass Historic Commission and asked about those kinds of things, mm -hmm. but I know only that uh, Watertown and Milton and Lexington are the ones that are, are um, now over more than, I think Lexington is 18 months mm -hmm. and the other two are two years. Okay. I think Attorney Cunningham may have some information. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mr. Chair, Ms. Robinson. I think Lexington is 21 months, Hopkinton is 18. I'm not aware of any 24, but there may be. Okay, thank you very much. Well, there are some that are. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I just don't know exactly how many. Yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so at this point, we'll uh, turn to the board for any preliminary questions, um, and then we'll go to public comment. So, any questions we're looking forward? Okay, let's let's go to public comment. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Oh, Mr. Diggins, there you are. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I, I get my hand up late, you know, so yeah, yeah. sorry about that, you know. So, yeah, so ahead, um, ahead, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, so, you say 12 months isn't enough time, you know. It, I'm not sure if I heard why it's not enough time, but let me ask a question a different way. What more resources would you need in order to make 12 months be enough time? Um, the thing about um, finding um, people who can evaluate historic houses now are very scarce. Right. And we try to ask um, the homeowner if we find something that we f want to know about the house itself and whether or not it should be preserved or whether or not they come to us, you know, just uh, as soon as they... Uh, ask for a demolition and they come to us you know like two months into that and on top of that um you know we don't have we we don't have time because we're working on so many houses right now and it is very difficult to get the the developer for example to go out and actually find people who are, um, you know, able to <clears throat> analyze the house itself. And I, I so just want to be clear. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I, I interrupted you. Please finish. I, and, and on top of that, I think that um, the, the biggest, uh, the, we do work over a year or maybe a year and a half or two years with houses um, that we have preserved and work with the, the owner. 
And so it takes a long time to do that in a lot of times. And, and there are met, not many contractors in some ways that could immediately jump in and help with um, historic buildings because of the fact that everybody is trying to change their houses and uh, sell them for millions. Gotcha. Or just get rid of them. And that's, okay. that's basically my, my two, the way that we work, we try to work very carefully with anybody that comes before us. And we do not want to penalize anybody who, you know, has a house that really has to come down or anything like that. You know, that's okay. But um, in Arlington, our, our mission is to preserve the houses that are good. Okay, I think I have my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of questions. I, I know you had mentioned Watertown, and, and I think in, in Watertown, while they allow up to 24 months, I think they also have a procedure where an owner can come back to the, um, whether it's a store commission or, or council, if they've done their due diligence and, and just have not found an alternative use. You're just proposing a flat 24 months um, demolition delay without any, any opportunity to shorten that if, if new facts no, emerge? We, would, we do shorten that. Okay. All we right. absolutely do that. You know, if, if we find out something that is, you know, not, we don't um, just say that we want to preserve the house because uh, it's historic entirely, but the status of the house and what the, the things are that have to be done to do those things, we, d we have changed those things. Okay, and, and just we a quick, oh, I'm sorry. We don't put any pressure on them to, to not go ahead. Okay, and, and then just a question, two years, I think that will be the longest period. I did say Watertown, but there's an exception. I know other communities have gone to 15, 18 months, and I think Newton actually does it based on if the, if, if the property can be on the National Register of Historic Places, it can be 18 months, all other properties are 12. Would, would that be something, I, I, the, the outside period feels like a long time to me, and I realize you've got to do your, your work, but I wonder if there's a way, um, if, if you gave any thought to um, other properties that, 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 that are not um, potentially eligible for listing on any historic registries for a shorter period, or does that just happen through your proceedings that, that maybe it will take less than that period of time? We, we take those things into consideration, and that's why I said that we don't, uh, you know, if we're working with a, a homeowner or something like that, um, we can work with that, and we don't have to do that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and we have, um, you know, in the inventories, we have a lot of buildings, <laughs> um, and we, we try to... Um, work with them very carefully so that we're doing, we feel that we're doing the right thing and preserving the right things. Thank you. Uh, before we move to public comment, any further questions for the board? Okay, let's now uh, have the public hearing for Article um, 18. Uh, Ms. Robbins, you can return to your seat in case anybody wishes to comment from the room. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll take Mr. Cook. And if you are in Zoom and wish to comment, on this article, please raise your hand at this time, and we'll get to you next. Grant Cook. Cook. Grant Cook, Precinct 16. I take the chair here to um, encourage you to keep the status quo. The comment that this isn't a penalty, repeated three times, tell, of course it's a penalty. It's a delay in demolition. If somebody comes to an impasse, it's 24 months sitting on a house that might be unlivable, unrentable, um, or just an impediment to the, what they want to do with their own property. Right now, it might be six or eight months of waiting, then it will be 18 months of waiting. Of course, it's a penalty. It's saying, do what we want, or we'll make you sit on the house. Now, the proponent says they work with homeowners. If the homeowner is willing to do this, then great. It may take 12 months, take 24 months to do the work. But you know, I, was, I watched a, 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 a hearing on this matter for a house on Warren Street, um, and the first thing was, 
and she did mention that, that it's difficult to find engineers. It was very difficult. And they gave the, proponent, the homeowner a list. The list wasn't accurate. There were people on there that no longer practiced. So it wasn't, the people on that list didn't have a relationship with the town. So you're calling them out of the blue. There's no commitment to support. And then after one engineer gave a prognosis that was pretty dim, well, then they did like my kids do. Let's do two out of three. Well, let's go find another engineer. Well, I am an engineer. I'll tell you how things have worked. First of all, engineers don't deal in, unless it's safety, in, in, in definites. Of course, with enough money and time, things can be saved. So the, the, the recommendations tend to be, well, this is kind of how it could be. That wasn't definitive enough for the boards. They said, find another engineer. Engineers also don't like to be hired to impeach each other. In a small community, and someone calls up, hey, I want you to... Jim looked at this, but I want you to look at his work, and if you have an issue with it, I want you to argue with him. So all of a sudden, it becomes a debate between two engineers as to the right path. In the end, there was an impasse. And the impasse comes to be, well, the homeowner has to wait. So that, to me, that seems purely punitive. Um, so in the sense of, of you know, it, it, it sucks that our homeowner, our homes are, have appreciated so much. Um, but it is, the, it is the way it is now. Um, you know, in this case, the, the home is demolished will become a two family. Two people will have homes. So that's a good thing right there. But I think 12 months is appropriate. If, if, uh, if the board, if the commission had significantly more resources and availability to help homeowners find a way to make this work, perhaps you could consider lengthening it. But they haven't demonstrated that. Um, so I would encourage you to keep the status quo as it is, 12 months, and vote no action on this article. Thank you, sir. Do we have anybody in Zoom who wishes to comment? All right. Anybody else in the room wish to comment on this article? We'll see if there's any more public comment. Okay, so uh, close public comment for this article, and let's go to the board for final discussion and motions. Mr. Hurd. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I am not in support of extending the demolition delay. My problem, and we've dealt with this historical registry a few times, you alluded to it. This is 29 pages with, I counted about 45 houses per page, give or take. There are way more buildings on there that can be, than can be considered historically significant. And I said, I think last time, it takes away from our actual historic bu buildings. I think when this demolition delay was created, I'm sure this list was dramatically smaller because we have some pretty awesome historic buildings in town. Um, just looking at this list, the house I grew up in on Colonial Drive, other than it being the house that I grew up in, <laughs> lacks well. very much significance <laughs> that I would see that would uh, re allow it to be on this list. And it's my understanding that most of Cal managers got dropped on the list at one point. And this, you know, I know an individual that, was go that wasn't a developer that was going to knock it. He, he wanted to renovate his house for his family and he wasn't able to do so. I mean, as a real estate attorney, I can tell you that this is not part of a normal review is to determine if your house is on Arlington's historically significant list. I think builders know that, homeowners don't know that. And it, there could be a situation where an, in a family comes in and they're looking to live in Arlington because they wanna live in Arlington because it's an amazing community and they find a property and they wanna renovate it to suit their family's needs and they, can't do, they find out that they can't do so. Um, again, to me, it's the list. It just is so long that it takes that there. I think it's over inclusive of buildings, and I, I just, I'm not inclined to increase the demolition delay based on that. So I, I submit a motion for no action. Okay, we have a motion for no action by Mr. Hurd. All right. So uh, further discussion. Motion seconds for the board. Second. Second by Mr. DeCourcy. All right, do we have any further discussion from the select board? Mr. Dickens. Okay, um, 
I'll just speak for myself. I think I also support the motion of no action. I'm, I'm appreciative of the work that the Historic Commission does. Um, and I'd be very happy to find ways to better support the commission um, within the availability of town resources to, to move more quickly, because I think that the work is important. Um, but I, I think I agree with my colleagues that at this time, the, we, ha we have a good workable uh, agreement. And I think further extension of that would require uh, more detailed work to really make sure that, as Mr. DeCourcy was suggesting, that there are um, some very specific um, and probably some very complex um, pr processes and exemptions built in. So, um, so I think we're ready to have a vote. So on a motion for uh, recommending no action by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, uh, Attorney Cunningham. Ms. Mahan? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and this uh, brings us to the last one article hearing of the night, which is Article 19, to vote to extend the time for the Artificial Turf Study Committee and report. Um, and if the uh, proponents would please introduce themselves. I'm Susan Stamps, Town Media Member, Precinct 3, 39 Grafton Street. Uh, Eugene Benson, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 10, Hillsdale Road. And what we're going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about this article and why we filed it and why we ask you to support it. And then Ms. Stamps is going to talk about her perception of how the committee's been working up to this point. Very well. I'll, I'll start by saying that Ms. Stamps and I filed the amendment at town meeting last year that was voted favorably at town meeting that set up uh, the committee. We expected the committee to start operating a year ago. It started operating only a few months ago. So we had concerns that they either wouldn't complete the job on time or that they would rush and it would not be as good a job as it could be if they had more time. As you may know, they were required to file their support, their report um, at least 30 days before town meeting. It's now fewer than 30 days before town meeting and they have not filed the report. Um, we filed this motion to give them more time. We felt that if we filed uh, this warrant article, excuse me, this warrant article, and it was supported by the board, it would send a message to the committee that they didn't have to rush for judgment that they would have some additional time to work on it and get it right. Um, and, and that's why we did it. And at the time, we didn't know whether they would file on time. Now we know that they haven't filed on time. Um, the other thing that we did, which we probably should have done last year when we filed our amendment, but we didn't because we didn't think of it, was require them to have at least one public hearing on a draft report before they file a final report so the public has an opportunity to hear it and to make comments on it. And, um, and they didn't do that because it's not in the current amendment. It would be in this. So we would like you to do this, even though as Ms. Stamps would tell you, they're pretty close right now. So they can take a breath and if they decide they want some more time to work on it, to have a public hearing, that they'll have the opportunity to do that um, and then file the report later this year. That's pretty much what this is about. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Stamps to talk about what the committee's been doing up to this point. So She's been watching, I have not. Thank you very much. Um, so I, the first commit, uh, meeting of the committee was on December 5th, uh, pretty late in the game. And I attended, and I have attended every meeting since then, except for I think one. And uh, and they've pretty much been meeting weekly. They've been. I have been thoroughly impressed by their diligence, their integrity, their um, balanced conversations. Um, it's been a startling contrast between the equanimity of the behavior of this committee versus what happened at town hall a year ago, you may remember, when it was sort of the against the anti-artificial turf 
versus the pro-artificial turf at town, at town hall. And it became so heated that the, the police had to be called. Um, and the reason that I'm telling you how great this committee has been is not only to, to publicly compliment them, um, but also to say, I would hope that uh, the town manager, uh, Mr. Feeney, might um, consider uh, calling back this committee um, when and if there is another artificial turf field being considered by Park and Rec so that we don't, and I, I believe, um, Mr. Chair, we spoke about that recently, so that we don't, because they are a wonderful, they would be a wonderful mediating mechanism. You had, um, and I'll just take a couple more minutes, there was one person from the Conservation Commission, one from Park and Rec, one from Capital Planning, one from Envision Arlington, uh, the Director of Health and Human Services, or her des designee, a town meeting member appointed by the moderator, and a town resident appointed by the select board. That's seven people. These were, everybody came in with different opinions. Um, the chair, Jim DiTulio, the select board um, appointee, um, divided the group into the three areas that our article asked them to study, which was health, safety, and environment. That's what they did. I invite everybody, I invite you folks and anybody who's watching on um, Zoom to look at the draft report they have attached to the March 12th, 2024 agenda of the Artificial Turf Study Committee, pages 61 to 83 are the three draft reports of the committee. And I'm sure like, like I was when I read it, I'm sure you'll be thoroughly impressed by the work. And so I would just, they've done great work. Will they be done by town meeting? Will they be done so it's time for, there's enough time for the select board, excuse me, and the, the, com the community to see what they've done, review the report, I don't know. Um, if, if not, we'll go forward with, you know, we'll decide at the time, should we go forward with this or not? Um, as Jean said, we want to make sure that they have the time they need to do this right, which I know they want to do. Um, but also, um, I just wanted to give them a, a huge shout out for a fantastic job and to say, and, and to, to ask the town manager who I think statutorily might have some purview over um, park and rec, I'm not sure, I'm just quickly reading uh, the law, um, to keep in mind maybe reconvening this same committee, not necessarily the same people, they may not want to do it again, but the representatives of the same groups to get us through another difficult period discussing artificial turf in town. Thank you. I'll just add sure. two things. One is our suggestion is that you vote favorably on this article. If between now and town meeting, they filed a report, then at town meeting, obviously, this article would become moot. But if they haven't filed it, then we would go ahead and give them an extension. So we think this is a good interim step to either give them some more time or they'll file their report late, but before town meeting, and then this will become moot at town meeting. The, the second thing I'll mention is this report, you know, as Susan said, I think will be a really good step for the town. But the issues are constantly changing, both you know, what's in artificial turf, um, what is being found out about the chemicals that come off artificial turf, the potential impact on people who are on the turf. So this is gonna be good. If the next thing that happens in two, three, four years is another proposal for artificial turf, we won't, we'll be able to rely on this as the starting point, but not the final word in three or four years. There'll have to be another look at this to bring it up to date, because the science is changing as well as what the industry is doing. And um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to, I did <clears throat> completely forget to mention the substance of this report, which was on the good side, it provides opportunities for exercise 
for the kids in town and get them off their screens, get out there, get some fresh air and exercise. But there's a big, long list of well-researched negatives, including toxins, you know, damage to ecology, wildlife, sure. um, heat problems, injuries. It's just an endless list of, of, of negative things. So. I'll just note that the, the report is now published, uh, the draft report, sorry, is published on the committee's website. I read it last night, and at least one of my colleagues did. So. Oh, it is? Yeah. Well, I wasn't aware yeah. of that. So, so it's, it is available, so I think the, the, the public can, uh, can avail themselves of that. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will now turn to the board to see if they have any initial comments or questions of, uh, for the proponents before we move to public comment. Okay. All right, now let's, let's now do the public hearing. I ask you to take your seats so we can uh, entertain uh, people from the public. And um, if you are in Zoom and wish to comment on this article, please raise your hand. And um, if you're in the room, um, I'm actually going to invite public comment, I think, from the chair of the Artificial Turf Study Committee to come up and, uh, and give the board uh, the perspective that he may have. And um, if you'd make your comment of about three minutes and then maybe stick around, because I think the board may have some questions for you as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jim DiTulio, Precinct 12 Town Meeting Member and Chair of the Arlington Artificial Turf Study Committee. And I can thank you for for sticking me with, uh, with this committee. And uh, I can thank the members for making me chair. And I do want to say, uh, Susan Stamps didn't know I was in the back of the room, so I didn't pay her to say any of those things. And, uh, <laughs> and I, it was a pleasant surprise to hear the, the kind words. Um, I'll simply pick up where Jean and Susan left off. Uh, I think they gave a very good rundown of where the committee is. Um, we did get a late start. And I sent this board and the town moderator a letter along with my secretary of the committee, Natasha Wade, and sort of summing up where we are. And this, I think the letter was dated Friday, March 15th, so about a little over a week ago. Um, and there's been even more progress since then. But essentially, we did get a late start. We started on December 5th, um, through no fault of anyone's, just that's when we got started. Um, but the group, I mean, we got started right before Christmas, but the group committed to weekly meetings. Um, and we've met now, as of today, we have met 12 times. There is a plan to meet three more times, so when all is said and done, we will have met 15 times in a very short span. I guarantee if this committee had started a year ago, we would not have met any more than that. <laughs> I'm, on a lot, I'm on some other town boards. We meet once a month. Very little happens between those meetings. No offense to those boards, but this committee, there is a lot happening every week. In addition, about a week after we were formed, we immediately uh, separated into working groups, environment, safety, health. Um, those working groups have been meeting constantly between our meetings. So if you count those, there's probably been you know, two, three dozen meetings happening at, you know, throughout the course of this, this process. Uh, but 15 of them would have been public meetings when all is said and done. Um, to Mr. Benson's point, our plan well, I'll t take a step back. We currently have a draft report out. Um, it is a draft report, but it is a pretty, pretty strong, in my opinion, uh, report that's pretty close to, to final. There will be tweaks. There will be input. We have a meeting tomorrow night where members will, members have seen pieces of this, but they haven't seen it all together until a few days ago. So we'll, we'll have a very uh, intense meeting tomorrow, I think, sort of going uh, section by section, hearing where people are. Um, that will be followed by next Tuesday, having a, a, well, all of our meetings have been public meetings, but it will be a meeting where there will be a, a much more of an opportunity for public input. I do want to make a note that we made a decision, it seemed controversial at the time, but I stand behind, totally behind it, and I think it's worked out very well, that at our first meeting, we had to decide whether we wanted, we met uh, exclusively remotely, but we had to decide whether we keep the chat open or not. Um, many people did not want to keep it open. I, uh, I decided we would keep it open and see how it goes and reserve the right to close it off if it didn't work. It actually, actually has worked out marvelously. Um, and there's been a lot of good comment made, very productive comment uh, throughout our meetings. So although there hasn't necessarily been a place where people can go to a mic and speak, we have had people chiming in throughout our meetings offering, you know, have you checked out this study or please, you know, talk to this person at some point in your, in your travels. Um, in addition, we've submitted, we've taken written comment from the public. 
uh, and we publish those with our minutes every, every week when we put out the minutes and the agenda for the next meeting. Uh, but next week, we will have something a little more closer to a traditional public input meeting where there will be microphones, it will be a hybrid format, and we will hear at town hall or in the annex um, actually hear from people about the report that's been out. And by that point, they will have had the report out for about 10 or 12 days. So um, it's still a short, it's, it's tight, but we're hoping to hear from people. Um, our goal is not to have it turn into something like the town hall forum. That's not the, the idea is not to have one side here and one side there. It's a, there's a report on the table. Tell us what you think. Tell us, you know, tell us if we got it right or got it wrong or if there are tweaks to be made. And then the idea is there'll be one final meeting after that. Uh, I think right now the plan is April 9th where we would take a final committee vote. And then uh, probably there'd be some final formatting, you know, issues and getting it ready, putting the appendix, you know, together, the, the basic administrative tasks. And my goal and the hope of the committee is that you will have, you and the town moderator will have in their hands a, a final committee report. If all goes well by April 12th. Um, if it doesn't, it may slide to the next week, but it will certainly be before, um, unless something very, very strange happens, it will certainly be before the gavel falls in the opening night of town meeting on April 24th. It is true we were supposed to, if you go by the, by the uh, amended article that passed last year, we were supposed to have handed this in 30 days before, so by my math, that would have been March 22nd, would have been last Friday. We will, we will miss that deadline, and we're very honest about that. We'll miss that deadline. We could have made that deadline, but we would have sacrificed quality. Um, frankly, probably there would have been a lot of typos. There, the committee just didn't feel comfortable doing that. And uh, taking, at the end of the day, I think it'll be three extra weeks to get it right, I think is the difference between a report we can stand behind for many years to come versus a report that, you know, frankly, would have looked a little slapdash. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, I'm agnostic on this current uh, article. Um, I will say uh, Mrs. Stamps came to me when she was proposing it, and this was a very different time period. This was late January. We had no idea where we were going. I mean, we knew where we were going, which we didn't know if we'd actually be able to deliver on a very tight timeline. Um, it turns out we did, but it was very uncertain in late January, and she, she told me she wanted to submit this sort of as a um, fail-safe. And I was fine with that. I said, I hope we don't need it, but it's nice to have it in case something goes wrong. I think we're at a point where I can say it's looking like we won't need it, um, but the final two or three weeks will, will determine that. But we're in really good shape right now to get this thing done before town meeting starts. Thank you very much, sir. Um, stick around in case we have yep. questions, yeah. Um, do we have any other members of the public who wish to comment on this article? Raise your hand in Zoom or in the room. Okay, Ms. Marr? Seeing none, thank you. All right, we'll now turn to the board and you can, uh, we can have further questions and comments of the board if you have uh, that of the chair or um, any other. I did have questions, but that was a very detailed explanation of the committee. Um, so I was gonna open that I'm inclined to give you an extension if you want more time, but it doesn't sound like you need it. So I mean, I would, since the Warren article seems to be moot at this point, just submit a motion for no action in the event, in the unlikely event that it, you do need it, then someone can submit a substitute motion, but I would rather start with no action and then uh, go from there if, if that's what the situation warrants. I think, could we also, could the select board also meet, you know, before town meeting and change its recommended vote on that occasion as well as an alternative? No? Yep. Yeah. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion, and uh, thank you, Mr. DeTullio, for, for your letter that, 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 that I saw also for your work as chair. And, and as Ms. Stamp said, I, I haven't attended every meeting. I've attended a few of them. I've been very impressed and have heard a lot of positive things because you've had different viewpoints and to get through 12 meetings in a short period of time. But it, it seems to me that um, you're going to have your public hearing. I did see the draft report that is, that is on the website, and also... Um, if the committee, it seems to me the outside deadline here is the end of this annual town meeting. And if the report wasn't gonna be submitted prior to then, then there would be a reason to extend the committee's charge. Based on what you're saying, I don't see that that's necessary. And, and 
I think having the vote of no action maybe gives you a little extra motivation to, to, to get things done before town meeting. And, and if it doesn't happen, we can, we can revisit it. But based on what I'm hearing tonight, I, I support Mr. Hurd's motion. Mr. Mahan. <clears throat> First, I want to say very heartfelt thank you. Uh, amazed how much you've been able to get done uh, in the committee uh, starting in December. Um, one of the things, um, and I've read through the draft report twice, I'm probably going to read it two more times, but one of the reasons I say that is I'm very appreciative of um, the citations and the links, um, as well as, you know, the qualities of those. Um, I know down on town meeting floor, we had 11 amendments, 13 amendments, I don't know how many we had. And uh, I'll be honest, I did not go through all the links to all the, attached to all the amendments because some of them I didn't recognize. And not that you have to be of a certain caliber, but you know, National Institutes of Health, you have Harvard EDU, you have, and then you have individual um, case reports on, especially around athletic, current athletic turf fields reports that have been put out. And those are extremely helpful. And I think, um, uh, I think an awful lot of town meeting members and the public um, really should avail themselves of, you can't possibly read every single one. That is my goal. I think one I haven't even read every single one. I was going to say, <laughs> I, 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 I've been trudging through, so, um, <laughs> but, um, but please pass on from this board to, to the, our colleagues on, on your committee, you know, our, not only our thanks, but with the studious nature w with which um, you all have been going through in the process you and Ms. Stamps um, outlined in terms of um, how you parceled out what the mandate request, whatever it was, um, to get that done. And I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, I'm not going to ask you if the turf field at the high school would have passed this muster, because <laughs> that's a whole nother, no. <laughs> that's a whole nother thing, as they say. Um, and I, I do think <laughs> this is a good um, starting point uh, moving forward. Um, because I do appreciate that it, it does say in there, although majority of the pages, two thirds are speaking about negative impacts uh, of artificial turf, but then there's a third um, about moving forward and, and recognizing that the science is still um, evolving uh, on that. And, you know, we're going to have it out there at the high school. And that, that's where people, maybe that's one of the things I'd pass on to you that a, quite a few people have come up to me, largely in the sports family mm -hmm. that have said, you know, um, we're doing it at the high school, that wasn't a problem, and I try to explain the contaminants underneath and things like that, um, and it was there. And w one of the things I've said to them is wait and have sent out an email to say that, you know, the draft report is out, you know, please avail yourself to look at this. Um, and it, it, it certainly is informative, and I hope, I know, most, if not all, town meeting members will um, read. I think it's 25, 28 pages long, um, not counting the links. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I just simply say to that, sure. you know, um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like, we have members who came at this who started at the first meeting in a certain place. And we had some people who started in no place. I was fairly neutral on it. Um, we had some members who leaned one way or the other. My goal and we're not there yet, but it's looking good, was I, we've seen other towns do a report like this and they have a minority report. I did not want a minority report. And it meant some people had to, on each side had to give a little. Um, but I don't think we sacrifice quality to, or integrity to put out the draft report that you have right now. And I'm very hopeful there will not be a minority report that this will be a unanimous or near unanimous vote of the committee that you know maybe doesn't represent everyone's views 100 percent but represents everyone's views to a place where they're comfortable to put their name on it and put their vote behind it thank you very much mr diggins well, well that was an interesting comment just there it also uh, I, I tend to like um minority, minority reports I mean, especially when they are full-throated it's always good to see like the other side of the argument in its full glory, you know, but I understand where you're coming from. You know, I wasn't going to say anything, you know, uh, but I am going to support the motion, you know, and I look forward to seeing the report. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I will also gladly support the motion. Um, I, I like Mr. DeCourcy's uh, suggested motivation in part uh, to keep the committee's feet to the fire, and I don't think there's going to be any need for that because you're clearly working very, very hard. Um, I will say as a veteran of a number of town bodies, I think that uh, 12 to 15 meetings uh, for a committee that works a whole year, that's pretty good for a full year's committee. So you've compressed that into a shorter time frame, but I know you've worked very hard meeting every week with the subcommittees. Uh, I also read the draft report last night and was frankly blown away with the quality of what I've seen um, and the thoroughness and the thoughtfulness and the fair-mindedness of it. And I know that it's not final, so you know that you have a little bit of work to do, and I'm glad to hear that you're having a public input session. Um, but I think for me, I don't have any concerns that the, the compressed timeline affected quality in, in the least. I think it's one of the better quality work products I've seen out of a town meeting committee, frankly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think we, we can reserve the, the ability either through a substitute motion. If, you know, if, you, if, you, if the committee comes to us and said, hey, we do need more time, I'm sure town meeting would be glad to grant that to you. I was glad to have, I'm glad to have this article because I think it gives it that safety valve um, or this body, this, the, the board could meet and change our recommended vote. Um, I also want to give my gratitude to the proponents, uh, particularly who authored the amendment in town meeting to create this committee. I think one of the important reasons for this committee's success um, in addition, of course, to the very hard work by the committee and, and in its chair, is the very clear charge that was given to the community by, by the vote in town meeting that, that they uh, did. And so I think that you've done a real service to the town in spurring this work and giving, setting the framework for the, the, the kind of quality report that I think we're about to see. So thank you all for that. Mr. Chair, if I could just make one quick comment. That, sure. You know, Susan Stamps, in my opinion, is sort of the, the model uh, citizen activist. She has been at, uh, she says she hasn't been at all of them. I think she has, so I'm going to give her credit for all 12 so far. Um, <coughs> she, she's been um, sticking with this all the way through. Sometimes people do a, more an article and then they forget about it, they move on. She hasn't. Um, she's kept us honest and we appreciate it. Excellent. Any further comments from the board? Okay, we have a, I have to go back to my notes here. We have a motion uh, for no action by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Cunningham. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Five zero vote. Thank you very much. Can I make one last little joke? I'm glad my wife didn't submit a letter saying, where's my husband been for the last <laughs> four months? But um, yeah. you only got a letter from me and I'm happy about that. I'll look forward to the bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank please, please thank her for us for tonight. All right, thanks. Okay, so that brings us to final votes and comments. We have articles for review, Article 6, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So we'll take these in turn, um, starting with Article 6. Turn to the board for comments, questions, motions. Move approval. Second. All right. Any discussion by the board? Okay. Um, I, if, I could, if I could ask, the room carries sound a lot better than we think, and, and we have some really boring business to finish here, but I need to make sure I can hear everybody. So I can take our, uh, our conversations outside, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mrs. Mahan. Any discussion? Okay, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Dickens. You're on mute. You're muted, sir. Sorry about that. Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Article 8, bylaw amendment, annual town meeting start date. Approval. Second. Okay. Any, uh, we have a motion for approval by Mr. Hurd, second by Mrs. Bahan. Any discussion from the board? Mr. Dickens? So, I thought, I thought we were going to hear from the town meeting procedures committee before we. Did anything? I thought this was like a stopgap until we got more information, and then we were going to decide whether or not we were going to take a position or not. So this is so this is for Article Eight. We have a will report. So is your is your question, Mr. Diggins, about the the voter or for or the comment? Or you or you're saying that you didn't think we would do even this much until we heard from Tommy Procedures. Right. I'm saying that I thought we weren't gonna do even this much until we heard from the Tommy Procedures Committee. My my recollection of the of the no, of the will report was that uh, we might wait until town meeting commenced and at that point see what additional input was available um, 
That could, it could include the town meeting procedures weighing in. It could include if the moderator chooses having a poll of town meeting. Um, it, I think we left that open-ended, but I didn't understand that we thought we would delay the vote of will report. Mr. Corsi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and Attorney Cunningham and Attorney Munson did put in the comment that, that we will potentially seek input from the town meeting procedures committee. So I, I, I think that possibility is still out there. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, but I, I, you see, this is going to town meeting though with us pretty much saying we put it all on you and we're not really giving you any recommendation, right? Is that a correct interpretation of this? I, th I think that, I mean, a will report means that we do intend to give a recommendation. Um, it's just that we may do that at a meeting before, one of our short meetings we have before town meeting where we're giving ourselves more time to decide based on input that may we receive. Mrs. Mahan? And also, my memory is that um, Mr. Christiana said that the town meeting, town meeting procedures committee may discuss this. He yeah. hadn't made the we decision yeah. yet yeah. Yeah. whether he right. would even bring it before them. So that's why another reason for the will report, so we don't keep discussing this over and over and over gotcha. again. Um, yeah. So right now so it's a will report, and it leaves the door open if any of that uh, other stuff happens. Otherwise, we are committing we will ourselves report. over to reporting. Yeah. All right. But, 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 then, but we will report. It's not that we may report. We are right. going to report. Will it's a will. Report. Yeah. Okay. W I L. -L. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. And just making sure that that, that is me, that, that we, we are embracing that word fully. So, okay. And then I will, you know, <laughs> vote. Uh, positive I'm action. I'm sorry, my <laughs> urge was to spell it for you. No, we, we're not doing that with any kind of strong, strongly recommended yeah, wording, of yeah, course, because yeah. we don't do that anymore. But, um, yeah, but, uh, 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 Attorney Cunningham yeah. has a comment, please. Oh, no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just hopefully that last sentence of the comments section, Mr. Diggins, addresses uh, the concerns. I think that that accurately reflects the, the direction of the board and the, the board's intentions. Um, hopefully that captured it properly. Attorney Munson and I watched rewatched the meeting about four times. <laughs> my my condolences. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Okay. And I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. On a uh, motion to approve by Mr. Hurd and second by Mrs. Maha and Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Why yes? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. <laughs> Five zero vote. <laughs> Article 9, bylaw amendment, revised town meeting start time. Um, approval. Second. Oh, you're making me pay attention now. Mm -hmm. All right, any discussion on this one? Got a motion uh, to approve by Mr. Hurd, second by Mr. DeCourcy, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Article 10, bylaw amendment start time for annual town meeting. And this is the start, you know, referring to the start date. Move approval. Second. <laughs> so I wants to sentence. You know how hot it is to keep <laughs> my mouth shut? You guys are really hurting me. Any discussion? On a motion to, uh, for approval by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Article 11, bylaw amendment, fossil fuel bylaw ch language changes. Move approval. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? On a motion for favorable uh, approval by uh, Mr. Hurd, seconded by, Mrs. seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Cunningham. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 4 0 vote. Mr. DeCourcy was uh, recused on that one. Very good. Thank you. Well done. Um, and my compliments on, on the, uh, the votes and the comments. I felt like you captured the board's uh, sentiments very well indeed. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You to you, to both of you. Okay, this brings us to new business. Except in cases of emergency, the board will neither deliberate nor act upon topics presented in new business. Ms. Marr. No new business, thank you. Attorney Cunningham. No new business, thank you. Mr. Feeney. No new business. Mrs. Mahan. Um, just very briefly, I'm um, glad to have the town manager back. Appreciate your Herculean Texas 
efforts to get back here. Um, and, and I do want to say um, that um, Ms. Conley, as acting town manager, really did an exemplary job. She was uh, answered very promptly uh, my individual queries as well as uh, kept up kept us up to speed. And not, I'm not playing the woman card, but it's nice to have a female acting town manager. But she really did a fantastic job, and um, and I don't know if I actually emailed that to her. Uh, I meant to, um, so please uh, pass along you know my my personal thanks for that because I know I sent her one particular query and as I saw not only the promptness she answered it but what the end result was um, I almost wanted to call to apologize for making all that work for her um, but um, she handled it very professionally and efficiently and it was appreciated so thank you that's it thank you for that Mr. Hurd she actually got married too Yes, yeah, she became Ms. Buongiorno. Oh, I meant to say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Ms. Buongiorno, oh Wait. my lord. I just A lot of people don't, don't know her as. Oh my gosh, no. I'm sorry, Ms. Buongiorno. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Mr. Hurd. Gets a little silly in here once everyone leaves the gallery. Close to um, <laughs> Let me take Spam. another hit of my wood. No, I just, for the second year in a row, I'd like to congratulate the Arlington Might AAA hockey team for uh, two-peating their Valley League championship on Saturday. It was a barn burner against the Belmont Might AAA team with some pretty good players, but they pulled it out. So we had some very excited Might players in Arlington this weekend. Who's it going? Dylan like the Wall Herd. <laughs> he certainly was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, briefly, um, I had learned just today, we had moved favorable action on Article 56, which is the prudent investor rule. I learned today that the, the Finance Committee actually took it up as well, and they moved no action. And I'm wondering, asking the Chair, perhaps, if we could put this on our agenda for a future. Maybe we discuss it, maybe we don't, but I think if there's a difference here, it behooves us to try to work it out um, prior to town meeting or get a better understanding of what their concerns were and um, incorporate that into our comments one way or the other. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Murray, would you take that note? Uh, maybe maybe uh, consider that for the next agenda, and I'll speak with the Finance Committee Chair um, in the meantime. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Mr. Diggins, any new business? Yeah, I, I had no new business, but I do support what Mr. Corsi um, suggested. Very much. Very well. Um, I all hey, I have no new business, so I think that concludes the agenda. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. A motion to adjourn by Mrs. Mahan, is seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Advisor vote. We are adjourned. Mm. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.